Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. This is our annual Taste for the Cure and a Taste for Science, a longstanding tradition that we have at the UCSF Breast Care Center, where we bring the latest in science to your now computer. Uh, but uh, next year, we're going to be live again. We're very excited about that, hopefully with the whole COVID scourge behind us. Hopefully, this will be our last virtual one. But it actually is pretty nice because we can reach many, many more people uh, doing it this way. And uh, we still get to share lots of fun things with you. Today, we're going to have you know, a relatively sh uh, short program, be about three hours. We are very excited to uh, have our cooking class as usual for our taste of healthy foods. Uh, healthy foods need not be uh, 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 difficult to make, nor should they uh, be untasty. So we're excited to share our Thai crispy tofu in lettuce cups with mango salsa today. And uh, Ali Mountford is back. And the two of us will be cooking in the kitchen in uh, about a half an hour. So. Uh, we just have a few things for you. If you have questions during the during the course of any of these uh, presentations, just use the Q and A box. Uh, Laura Van Veer will be moderating those questions, and we'll have a chance during our uh, after our panel to answer all kinds of questions. We'll have about forty minutes to answer as many questions as we possibly can. We're doing something a little bit new this year. We are actually having language interpretation. We'll have Mandarin, and we'll have. Uh, We'll have Spanish uh, and Cantonese this year, and we'll see how we'll we'll see if uh, how that works. We're trying to broaden the reach, uh, and and make sure that we can get the information in, uh, out to everybody in every language that's comfortable for them. Uh, we'd like you to join via your computer audio whenever possible uh, to get the best experience. Put the Zoom in the full screen mode. Uh, if you uh, want to contact us. Uh, Use taste for the cure at ucsf.edu. We will have a resource handout and a recording of the event online at the following message. You can see it up there on the screen. We'll do this, and we hope uh, that those of you uh, who are going to be joining us will join along in the in the and cook with us, or you can watch us and then make it as soon as we get off the air, or sometime tomorrow or next week, whenever you feel like it. Okay, so I'd like to just take a moment and introduce uh, Rosa Arce, who is organizing all of the interpreters this year, and just give you a moment of instructions and introduce the different interpreters so that hopefully um, we can help people understand what's going on in their native language. Rosa? Rosa, can you just turn your audio on? Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Esserman. Uh, si en un momento si están reuniéndose para escuchar en español, por favor, en cuando aparezca en la pantalla la opción de interpretación, puede elegir eh, un botón que se ve como un globo si se está reuniendo con una computadora portátil o una computadora. Y si está reuniéndose por un teléfono o un uh, celular o móvil, se puede conectar tocando los tres puntitos que dicen más o more y ahí puede ver que ve la eh, opción uh, interpretation o in language interpretation, interpretación. Al tocar eso puede elegir su idioma preferido. Si está conectándose computadora, al tocar el botón del globo, puede ver la opción que va a aparecer con los tres idiomas de español, cantonés y mandarín. And I invite our, our Cantonese interpreter to provide these same instructions. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, Rosa. Uh, this is Teresa, and I am going to um, um, do the um, Cantonese language. Uh, 
啊翻譯嘅，咁你咧就點擊佢，咁就可以收聽到我哋廣東話嗰個語言嘅翻譯噶啦嚇。咁如果你用個智能手機嘅咧，咁你咧就撳一個咧，就會見到咧上邊啦就有個寫住 more， 即係多啲嗰三個點嗰度。咁樣咧就可以咧，就係揀選我哋嗰個廣東話嘅翻譯嘅喎。OK， 好啦。啊、uh, ，Yes， thank you。Thank you so much, Teresa. Now I invite our Mandarin interpreter to、um, provide these same instructions. Thank you。喂，你好。呃、uh, ，Hello， that is Mandarin interpreter。喂，你好。啊、uh, ，我是。呃，中文的翻译。那今天呢，在讲话的时候呢，我会跟另外一女士 c a s s i e 我们可以为大家服为大家服务，好吧？好，那谢谢各位，好，再见。Thank you， 谢谢。Okay， great。So we're going to go on now. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the day.、Uh, we're going to start with、uh, flash talks. From our、uh, breast care center interns,、um, we are really lucky to have、uh, a fantastic crew of of people who are taking a year or two off after they finish college, and、um, they spend a year as our study coordinators and research assistants, and they actually also serve to help、uh, patients prepare for their consultations,、uh, helping them generate question lists. Recording the conversations and providing them a summary of their uh, of their uh, consultation. You'll hear a little bit more about that in the flash talks. And this fantastic group of people now has prepared some flash talks, three minutes each. And we're going to start first uh, with um, with uh, talks about、uh, the services we have in the breast care center. We're then going to switch to our cooking demonstration. We're going to have、uh, a talk, our Taste of Science talk this year by、uh, Dr. Laura Van Veer,、uh, uh, my partner in crime and co-leader of the、uh, breast program,、uh, with me at the at the、uh, UCSF、uh, Helen Diller、uh, Cancer Comprehensive Cancer Center, and then we're going to have、uh, some more flash talks, really talking about trials. And some exciting trials. Just a few examples of some exciting trials, because our panel then is going to come and talk about why it's so important to have clinical trials. When、uh, we met with the first lady yesterday,、uh, when she came to visit the cancer center, she expressed the comment that it was scary to think about a clinical trial, and it just reminds me of how important it is to really educate everyone in the public that cancer. Can, that clinical trials are tomorrow's treatments today, and they're an opportunity to be able to receive more advanced treatments or new things. And we want to talk a little bit more about that. And they are really available across every stage of treatment, from diagnosis to survivorship. And、uh, we want to make sure that people really understand how important they are to everyone and to our ability to move the field forward. So, without further ado,、um, okay, Arashna, let's go to the next slides and let's get started with our intern flash talks.、Uh, so,、uh, we're going to talk at this first、uh, this first component. These talks will be quick, three minutes each, and、uh, we are going to、uh, go through these.、Uh, you'll see these. Are, this is our whole intern group. They're fantastic. So, our first talk. Is going to be from Elena um, um,、uh, Supervali, and she's going to talk about how we empower patients with patient scribes. Elena, thank you, Dr. Esmeran, and thank you everyone for sharing your Saturday mornings with us. I'm Elena, and I'm really excited to tell you how we empower patients with patient scribes at our breast care center. Next slide, please. At UCSF, we believe that effective medical care requires patient engagement. However, in order for patients to participate in their medical care, they need to be fully informed about their diagnosis, treatment options, risks and benefits, and many more. 
And patients find themselves having to absorb all this new information during their appointments, which as you know, can be long, stressful and overwhelming. Unsurprisingly, this type of approach leads patients to immediately forget 40 to 80% of information they are provided by their medical professionals, and one half of what they remember ends up being incorrect. So this leads us to pose an important question, which is how can we um, empower patients to better absorb this new medical information so they can participate in their medical care? Next slide, please. To accomplish this goal, we started offering patient scribes who uh, support patients at all stages of their appointments. Before their appointments, patient scribes send patients educational materials and help them develop question lists to ask their doctors. With this background knowledge and well thought out question lists, patients are better equipped to absorb new medical information that is provided to them by their providers during their appointments. Patient scribes also attend appointments, record it, and take notes in a patient-friendly manner, allowing patients to revisit their interaction with their doctors at any point. Importantly, randomized clinical trials have shown that these strategies are extremely effective, leading to increased question asking, knowledge, recall, and satisfaction, as well as decreased anxiety and regret. Next slide, please. Uh, importantly, the value of our services is also reflected in the testimonials that we have received from patients themselves. For example, this breast cancer patient described patient scribes as a wonderful gift of service. Next slide, please. So if you have an upcoming appointment at Breast Care Center and would be interested in receiving patient scribe services, please reach out to us at psc at ucsf.edu and we will try our best to provide these services to you. Thank you so much. Okay. Our next, um, our next talk, we're going to tell you a little bit more about all of these fabulous interns uh, and where they've been and where they're going uh, and uh, a little bit about how we're playing our part in training the next generation of patient-centered physicians. And we're going to hear about this from Alex Bateo. Alex? Hello, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. So let's get started. So for my presentation today, I'll be covering the UCSF BCC internship program, creating the next generation of physicians. So who are we? So we are a diverse group of individuals who are all interested in pursuing careers in medicine or public health. We come from a variety of backgrounds, undergraduate schools, and parts of the county, a country. The objective of this internship is to create better doctors, better healthcare professionals, better researchers by exposing and preparing us for the future rigors and rewards of healthcare, including developing a research project, conducting a clinical trial, assisting with integrating patient care, collaborating in decision-making process. Each intern is assigned project based on their strengths and interests. Additionally, we collaborate on a variety of projects with our mentors and fellow interns, learning from each other along the way. When you hear, when you're here, culminates uh, with the final research project, which we present our fellow interns, the incoming class of interns, our mentors, and breast care positions, faculty, and staff. Today, you will see some of the many projects we are working on this year, so stay tuned. Next slide, please. This, uh, this internship was created in 2005 and has grown every year to include more robust experiences, larger and more impactful scientific research, as well as more hands-on training with patients and mentors. Can you find the intern class of 2020 in the group of photos above? It's a Zoom one. Like the rest of the world, we had to adapt over the past few years and find innovative ways to connect, collaborate, and continue our work. When you see all these faces, you may be wondering, where are they now? Next slide, please. Like any good research project, we look at our data and outcomes, and, uh, and outcomes are important to measure. So as of now, 24% are medical students, 21% are residents, 
and 43% are practicing physicians, and the 12% are either in tech, education, or other careers. Previous interns have shared the relations built during this program continue throughout medical school, residency, and above. This June, all previous and current interns were gathered for a reunion titled Sparkling Innovation and in Healthcare Value, where we will all gather again to share ideas and learn from each other. Next slide. Lastly, if you know anybody who's interested in pursuing a career in medicine or public health, has finished college, and wants to learn more about this program, please check out our new Breast Care Center internship website. On this website, you'll find more information about the internship, intern projects, testimonials, and how to apply. And if you have any questions, feel free to email pccinternship at ucsf.edu. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. That was a fantastic mm -hmm. overview of the internship program. So exciting to see, and I'm so excited to see everyone come back and see all the exciting things that they're up to. Uh, and uh, we'll make that program available to anyone who's interested in attending, so let us know. All right, our next uh, patient service is going to be talked about by Kristen Enriquez, and she's going to talk about scalp cooling, which is a way to help prevent hair loss during chemotherapy. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Esserman. As Alex just discussed, one important thing that we learned from this program is how to pay attention to what matters to patients, and one of these things is hair loss. So today I will be talking about scalp cooling. Next slide, please. First, what is scalp cooling or cold caps? A cold cap is a medical device that you can use during each chemotherapy treatment to increase your chance of keeping your hair by cooling your scalp. The device narrows the blood vessels in your scalp, reducing blood flow and the amount of chemotherapy drug that is delivered to hair follicles that support hair growth. The coldness also decreases metabolic activity of the hair follicles. Less active follicles may be less sensitive to chemotherapy. Overall, this means that chemotherapy may have less of a chance of damaging your hair follicles. Next slide, please. So why use cold caps? There are many reasons why patients consider cold caps. Cold caps can help patients preserve their hair during chemotherapy and help with hair re regrowth once chemotherapy treatment is completed. Cold caps can also help patients maintain a sense of control, privacy, and identity during treatment. There are other factors to keep in mind when choosing to use cold caps. These include longer days in the infusion center because variable post-cooling time is required, discomfort or pain from the cold, and the cost of cold caps. We also want to emphasize that even with cold caps use, some hair loss can occur on your head and elsewhere on your body. And for some patients and some chemotherapy regimens, cold caps will not be successful in preventing hair loss. With these factors in mind, Let's explore the options for cold caps at UCSF. Next slide, please. The first option we have is called Digni Caps. This is a cap that is connected to an in-house machine, which provides continuous cooling throughout your treatment. A member of the UCSF medical assistant team will help you in getting set up with the cap. The second option at UCSF is Penguin Caps. This is a manual system with a set of cold caps that you store in a freezer or in a cooler. Penguin Caps requires a second person to help you switch out the cold cap every 30 minutes with a newly frozen cap. As you consider these options, there are some financial and logistical barriers that you may want to keep in mind. As of this year, some insurance companies may reimburse for a portion of cold caps cost, but this is by no means guaranteed. If you are seeking financial assistance, one resource is called Hair to Stay a national nonprofit organization that provides subsidies to cover costs for patients using cold caps. You can see if you are eligible and apply for a subsidy on the Hair to Stay website. Next slide, please. The future of cold caps may include a scalp cooling device that combines the easy to use machine-based system of Digni Cap with the portability of Penguin Caps. We are working with the company Cooler Heads on this project, and we are very excited about it as it could be a more convenient system for patients. So if you're interested in using cold caps or if you have any questions, please reach out to our cold caps coordinators, Kelsey Kuahara and Eliza Hurst. Thanks for taking the time to learn about cold caps today. Thanks so much, Kelsey. Uh, and there was a question about how to 
get a patient scribe. If you have an appointment upcoming at the UCSF Breast Care Center, just tell your scheduler, the person you're, uh, when you're scheduling your appointment that you'd like a patient scribe or um, uh, the um, patient, uh, to say you'd like to work with the patient support core or get a, a patient scribe and we'll get it all set up for you. Um, okay, so next is uh, Kelsey Kuhara, uh, and she's going to talk about our new program, the Breast Cancer Cafe, because we know that life, that cancer upends people's lives. And so we've got a whole new program uh, for people to help them navigate life with a diagnosis of breast cancer. So uh, it's started by our nurse practitioner, Shelley Stratford, and Kelsey, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Esselman, for that introduction, and Kristen for that amazing overview of cold caps. Continuing on that theme of providing patient-centered resources, today I will be talking about the Breast Cancer Cafe, which is designed to help people navigating life with breast cancer. Next slide, please. As we all know, a diagnosis of breast cancer causes a lot of anxiety, and there's much to process outside of an appointment with your providers. In an effort to reduce some of this confusion, we have implemented the Breast Cancer Cafe. The goal of the Breast Cancer Cafe is to help those with breast cancer navigate their experience through providing practical education and helpful resources and ensuring that patients have someone to talk to and can access mental health resources. The Breast Cancer Cafe is a bi-weekly virtual drop-in session for breast cancer patients with the diagnosis, including those with DCIS, who have questions, concerns, confusion, or anxieties about their treatment plans, diagnosis, and care. Next slide, please. To emphasize, the Breast Cancer Cafe is a supportive environment for attendees to ask about the social and emotional aspects of managing breast cancer. We envision it as an office hours of sorts to ask any general questions about breast cancer uh, diagnosis and treatment plans. And we can provide specific resources that align with your needs. Here, I've highlighted a few themes. In past sessions, we've explored how to cope with physical and psychological effects of breast cancer treatment, how to prepare for treatment, whether that be surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, medical therapy, or recovery, how to navigate the UCSF Breast Care Center, who to ask and how to get those questions answered. And we're also happy to help with the decision-making process. It is also a great opportunity for patients to share the experiences and insights with others as these group dynamics are incredibly powerful. Next slide, please. Using the common topics and questions that we have identified, we hope to one day host webinars that can reach a broader group of people. Additionally, in the future, we hope to create a coping with cancer resource list and ultimately learn from patient experiences to find new ways to improve the quality of care we provide here at the BCC. I'll close with a quote from Shelley. Following a recent cafe meeting, she said a patient who had just undergone surgery discussed her experience with someone who was preparing for it. Connecting with others who are on the same journey reduces stress and anxiety and assists patients in managing the emotional aspects of breast cancer. She hopes that once it's safe to do so, the participants of the Breast Cancer Cafe will be able to meet in person over coffee. If you're interested in signing up or checking out the cafe, please scan the QR code here or feel free to give me a call with any questions. We hope to see you soon at the next cafe. Thank you so much for that, uh, Kelsey. That is so exciting. Um, and we just love this new program. It's something we used to do many, many years ago uh, and have brought back because, um, uh, because it's so uh, meaningful to, to patients and so helpful and just everyone's collective experience helps everyone else and reminds people that you're not always gonna feel so discombobulated as you do at the beginning. And one of the other things that we like to do is provide additional resources for those people who really wanna dive deep. Now, not everybody wants to know every detail, but some people really do. And for that, we're gonna have Tamia Jones talk to us about our program of Ask Your Pathologist. Tamia. Thank you so much for that introduction, Laura. And yes, continuing with the theme for Taste for the Cure and the general expectation for care at UCSF, we want patients to feel educated and informed by providing ample opportunities to ask questions. And we do just that with our service, Ask Your Pathologist. Next slide, please. Before we get into it, let's think. 
what is a pathology report? A pathology report describes the characteristics of a tissue of a specimen that is taken from a patient during a surgical procedure. Following a surgical procedure, every patient has a pathology report available to them. So what's the use of our service, you may ask? Let's say you have an enlightening day in clinic. Your surgeon or oncologist explains the results of your pathology report. You have a nice drive home, you sit on the couch, and it may look like something on the left. For some individuals, they may recognize some of the words, margins, DCIS, and that's enough for them. But for other individuals, it may look like alphabet soup. And we don't drink alphabet soup here at UCSF. We don't even serve it in the cafeteria. So for those patients that have additional questions about their pathology report, how can you tell I'm ERPR positive or negative? What are margins? This is a service for you. We encourage you to ask your pathologist. Next slide, please. The Ask Your Pathologist session is broken into three parts. First, it starts with you, the patient. Express interest in learning more about your pathology report. Then you'll meet me in the second step, yours truly, a UCSF Breast Care Center intern. And together we'll make a list of questions, comments, and your concerns related to your pathology report. And then third, you'll meet our UCSF resident pathologist. And we'll have a free consultation where we go in depth about your questions, your comments, and your concerns. Once again, as they're related to your pathology report. Next slide, please. But don't just take my word from it. Take it from the patients that have actually used our program. Looking at the second quote here, my goal is to feel more comfortable with my treatment decisions and I can walk away feeling happy and informed. I'm glad I had time post-treatment and surgery to process my complex case before seeing it in person on the slides. And that's something that I wanna emphasize. There is no time limit to this service. Whenever you have questions here, or across all these services at UCSF, we want patients to know that we wanna hear their questions and we wanna hear their voice. Next slide, please. If you have questions about your pathology report, additionally, we ask you to ask your pathologist. So please, if you have questions, um, reach out to Dr. Balsanian and myself. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Tamia. And uh, I want to especially thank uh, Dr. Ron Balasanian for this amazing service he does. He volunteers all of this time just to help make sure that patients who want to dive deep and actually see what the slides look like, uh, he volunteers his time to go over it um, with anyone who wants that. Uh, so thank you again, Ron, and thank you, Tamia, for coordinating it. We're going to transition now to talking about some of the trials. We'll kind of set the stage with a teasing you about one trial. And then after our cooking demonstration and Dr. Van Fier's uh, presentation about science, we're gonna dive deep into the rest of the trials before our panel. So all of you can be thinking about questions about some of these trials or other questions that you might have. So we're gonna start with Meta Danuka, who's gonna talk about uh, rethinking breast cancer screening with the wisdom study. Just like Ask Your Pathologist helps guide patients through their pathology reports, the WISDOM study aims to guide patients through the breast cancer screening process. So what are some of the goals of screening? The first is to detect cancer before any symptoms occur. And the second is to catch the cancer while it's still localized, before it spreads. However, even the experts disagree how to do this. For example, the United States Preventive Task Force suggests that when every woman should get a mammogram starting at age 50, and get one once every two years. Meanwhile, the American College of Radiology splits women into two groups, average risk and high risk, based on risk factors such as family history, breast density, personal history, and genetics. Average risk women should get a mammogram once a year starting at 40, and high risk women should get a mammogram and an MRI once a year starting at 30. Some of the reason for this confusion is because breast cancer is many different diseases, and so one size does not fit all. Tumors grow at different rates, which I will demonstrate with these four examples. Tumors like A and B are very slow growing and may never become a clinical problem, whereas tumors like D develop very quickly and current screening does not catch them in time. It may be before screening age is recommended or in between screens. So tumors like tumor C get the most benefit from current screening methodologies. 
However, why are we treating all women like they will develop tumor C? This brings me to the idea of precision screening, which is already being used for cancers such as colon cancer. You get a different recommendation for colonoscopies based on how many polyps you may or may not have. It's not always the same. Precision screening focuses on pinpointing high-risk patients and focuses on prevention for them. And for low-risk patients or patients who may never develop cancer, they want to reduce the tre treatment burden for them. This way we can channel our resources towards the people who need them most. We do this by information sharing, such as what are some of the risk factors that may cause breast cancer. The WISDOM study is pioneering precision screening for breast cancer. It's completely online for an, at no extra cost. All you have to do is identify as female or as a trans man or woman and be between 40 to 74 years old, live in the United States and have not had breast cancer or ductal carcinoma in situ. If you or anyone you know fits into these categories, help us screen smarter. Join Wisdom today at thewisdomstudy.org, or you can talk to me after. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. It's now time for our uh, cooking demonstration. And give me one minute, and I'll see you in the kitchen. Uh, Ellie, go ahead and start. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Laura. I'm so excited and exciting. We'll be back in person next year, too. It has been super fun to do this on the computer because I live so far away. I used to live just up the street, and now it's like I can be in your kitchen. Okay, again, the first thing you have to do. Say hi to Allie. Hi, Allie. Yes, How's it going? All right. You ready? I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Are we live? far as I can tell. <laughs> okay, so I want to say that I've, I first thing you have to do when you're in the kitchen, especially if you're dressed up, is get a good apron. And I have one just for the occasion. That is excellent. I, you know, I had my taste for the Cure apron from so many years ago, and I couldn't find it this morning. It's got the sequined lips on it. I know. I think I have mine in the drawer. I'll, you want to, want to borrow it? Yes, definitely. I'll be right there. <laughs> okay. So for, for the crowd here, um, I had to convince Laura that we were going to make tofu today because I'm a fan and she is not typically such a fan, but we're going to change her mind with this recipe, recipe today. And I have a few tricks up my sleeve to make it extra delicious. Ready? Yeah. Okay. So the first one, I've been texting her all week to make sure she did this most important step, which is going to change the texture of the tofu. So we're going to make like lettuce wraps with a mango salsa and a peanut sauce, all of those things, super delicious. But what we're doing with the tofu is keep it in its package when you buy it and just pop it immediately in the freezer just until it's frozen, doesn't matter how long it's in there or not, and then let it defrost. And what that does is it changes the texture of the tofu because the ice crystals are like, you know, shards and they puncture the cells. So it lets extra water out of the tofu. That way we can get it to be super, super crispy. And it almost has a texture of like croutons at the end more than like a soft tofu. And it's become my favorite way to do crispy tofu. So this block is extra firm. It's been in the freezer and now it's defrosted. And you can kind of see the liquid just like pours out of it. Okay, you got yours? And, and of course, I did just as Ellie told me, but I forgot to take it out of the freezer yesterday. So that's the, that's the biggest downside. But on the other hand, when I go to the store, I usually fi buy a few blocks and then I just throw it in my freezer. So it's sort of always there and ready to go. But what you can do to speed up the defrosting is keep it in its package, get a big bowl, fill it with warm water, and just let it defrost in there a little bit. Unlike defrosting that, fish. That, that did the trick. But just in, case, just in case, I have an alternative, because you always have to have plan B in the kitchen. Frankly, exactly. I'm skeptical about this tofu, crispy tofu business, and I wanted to make sure that I could add a little something, a little salmon, a little healthy salmon. So I'm going to start preparing that, because I'm still not sure how that tofu is going to come out that I defrosted. Right. Last minute, throw a little olive oil, a little lemon pepper. Oh, and the 
So if recipe. you're following this recipe and you're either also not a fan of tofu or maybe you're halfway there and you also forgot it in the freezer, this is a great, you know, it's two sauces. It's a lettuce cup. You could do it with mushrooms. You could do it with chicken, um, with salmon or shrimp would be fantastic. So it's really super flexible. And that's my favorite type of recipe. So you can see if you're a tofu eater, you can see that the texture of this is really different. It almost looks like a sponge. And I'm gonna go with that texture just by crumbling it up. I'm not gonna slice it because I want sort of all this cragginess. Let me pop this down so you can see. And I'm just gonna put this on my baking sheet. Okay, so that is trick number one to make the tofu super crispy. Trick number two, and I'm leaving this unseasoned. Um, We're gonna marinate it after it comes out of the oven. Trick number two is cornstarch. So I'm gonna take just a little spoonful of cornstarch and sprinkle this over the top and then toss that. The cornstarch is gonna further dry it out and it gets really super duper crispy when it's coated with cornstarch. So once I, you know, you can see it kind of melts into it. So it's not, it's not caked on there, just enough to coat everything. And then I'm gonna do a little drizzle of oil over the top of that. You can measure it if you're paying attention or just drizzle it over. I had um, all, an olive oil blend in there, which kind of isn't classic for Thai flavors. Usually you would use something with a little less um, potency to it, but that's a pretty standard quality olive oil. So it doesn't have a lot of flavor. Okay. Where's my towel? Okay, this is it. So mine's going in the oven. All right, and I have my oven set to 425 degrees. I'm gonna put it in the lowest part of my oven um, because it'll help it get super crispy that way. And I'm gonna move on to the sauce. Laura, I see you have some peanut butter over there. You're ready to go? I'm, I'm, I'm on it. Okay, so a peanut sauce is so delicious. I could eat anything dipped in peanut sauce. And it will also last in your fridge for a long time once you make it, easily two or three weeks. So sometimes I like to um, double the batch and then keep it around for a little while. And since one of my hallmarks is using up everything in your fridge and not letting anything go to a waste, I especially love making the peanut sauce when my jar of peanut butter is kind of low and there's not that much left in here. And this is a plastic jar, unfortunately, but if you have a glass jar, you can actually just pop this in the microwave um, or in some warm water to start to melt the peanut butter a little bit. But what I'm gonna do instead, because obviously I don't want to microwave plastic, I'm gonna heat my other ingredients in this glass container. So we're gonna get um, a little bit of apple cider vinegar. I'm gonna do a splash of tamari. This is tamari, if you're not using it yet, is a basically a gluten-free soy sauce. But more than that, it has a slightly different taste to it. I think it, it's it's got a very interesting, deep flavor that's a little less salty than classic soy sauce. So I use tamari, even though I'm not gluten-free, I just really like the way it tastes. And then that was sesame oil. And I'm also gonna put in a little bit of honey. You could use maple syrup, agave. And if you're avoiding sugar, you could just leave it out. It wouldn't be the end of the world. Um, the thing about Thai cooking or a lot of Asian sauces is that you really like to balance tangy and sweet and umami and salty. So the sweetness in there, if you can use it, it does help balance out the flavor. And I just have a regular peanut sauce here, or rather we have a question butter. in the chat. We have a question in the chat. For those with a peanut allergy, can almond butter be used? Absolutely, or even cashew butter would be make a delicious sauce, but you could use probably any of the nut butters for sure. You could even um, use the sunflower butter. My kids have that a lot um, to go to school when they can't bring peanut butter. So any of those that you enjoy works. You're chopping. Okay, so we're gonna do dueling sauces. I think it always makes a dish extra fun to have two sauces. Um, it makes it really fun for everybody to serve and everybody can make their own. But first I'm gonna get, so this is my warmed liquids and I'm gonna pour them right into the rest of my peanut butter. So the recipe calls for about a third a cup of peanut butter. So I made sure I eyeballed it and I have about the right amount. So the reason that I'm doing it this way is then I don't have to waste a lot of time scraping every last bit of peanut butter right out of my jar. 
and I can just shake it up. And then the sauce, basically. Say, here's, if you if you don't want to have to scrape, there's some very cool little tools. If you're a kitchen gadget person. This keeps you able to scrape every last little bit out. You always have the best kitchen gadget tools. I do. You know what? I should have melted my peanut butter, but I'm going to figure it out. Do I'm you still mad. have the little lemon squeezer thing? We're going to use I some really, lime. I, I don't know where I lost my green one, but Michael found this for me just yesterday. So it's awesome. Perfect. So I'm going to help this out a little bit just by stirring it up. But as it sits, the peanut butter will warm up and it just helps it kind of come together a little bit. You can see. And even if you don't warm it up, you know, if you just do it a little bit at a time, just yep. a little bit at a time, that lime will help dissolve things and get it going. And once, once you get it so it's not quite such of a mess, then you can start to pull it all together. I'm going to add also some garlic in here. One of the other reasons I really wanted to do this um, recipe and these sauces today is because it's, it's really a recipe that you can experiment with. Um, you, if you don't like garlic, you can go easier on the garlic. If you like it a little spicy, I love to put a little sriracha or hot sauce into here. Um, you can go, you know, as I mentioned with the sugar, you can go sweeter or less sweet. So it's really a sauce that you can play around with. And I feel like it's a great, you know, if you're kind of just learning to enjoy cooking, it's a really fun one where you can taste it, see what you like, add more or less of things. I guess you can't go backwards and add less things, but if you start slowly and just add a little bit as you go, then you can really have fun with this one. And it would also be a really fun sauce to make with your family. I have two little kids and they like to help a little bit. So this would be the kind of sauce I would have them help with and then let them be on their way once they lose interest in the, uh, in the whole process. One thing about the garlic, when you're, you know, if you just, you know I me, mean, I like knives. So anyway, just put it up like this and then you just sort of put it put your garlic in and if you get it all over your fingers you can take that lime and get the garlic off your fingers because then you won't be smelling it and putting it under if you rub your eyes it won't go in your eyes either so then you can just take this and then just put your fingers in the garlic or the lime or the lemon and get it off your fingers which is a great thing perfect tip I'm going to take my I'm going to take my plan B salmon off the mark off the off the grill. Here's my peanut sauce. Oops. I love the how the peanut sauce gets a little bit darker and it gets this beautiful shiny texture. Ooh, the salmon looks great. And how fast was that? Too? So that took me two minutes to make. Just in case that tofu tastes weird. Tofu doesn't taste weird. It's delicious. Okay, um, it has been in there for a little while. So what I'm going to do is take it out and I'm going to toss it. Um, it will start to get brown on the bottom first. So I do want to just kind of give it a turn. And then I'm going to do a few more minutes in there. And we're going to make two more sauces. So we're going to do a marinade. This is what's going to give the tofu all of its flavor. So for the marinade, I'm going to do more tamari, about a tablespoon. And this is where I'm going to put my lime. I'm also going to do a little bit of honey. So I like to, again, bring the sweetness, but if you need to leave this part out, it'll still taste okay if you leave it out. And you could make a syrup or whatever. Um, you could use even brown sugar if you prefer. And I'm gonna, and then, try, I'm gonna try just taking my peanut sauce and, and using it in the pan with my tofu. Let's see how that you You can do that, but if you don't like the tofu, then you can't blame it on my recipe because you're, uh, you're going rogue over there. All right, here we go. Oh my God, it's so crispy. <laughs> Wait, did you put the marinade on it? Because the marinade is what's going to give it all the flavor. Tofu is just kind of a mild, um, yeah, it's a mild it's taste. It's so very crispy, but it, does, it definitely tastes like cardboard. Okay. Wait till you get the marinade and the peanut butter sauce. So my limes were absolutely terrible. No, um, they they're are kind of like terrible too. They're like, ugh. Rock solid. So one of the things you see me doing is rolling it, but I also have my microwave here. If you put your limes or lemons, it works for in the microwave just for like 10 or 12 seconds. It helps to soften it up a little bit. You don't want enough to get it warm, but you can feel it's a little softer. It's really, really rough. Um, it's try, I'm, I'm gonna try like toasting my, I'm gonna try toasting my coconut and my, and my uh, 
and my peanuts in the stove. And then I'm going to put the tofu in with like two thirds of my peanut sauce. I'm going to see what happens. And then I'm going to blame you if I don't like it, Allie. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm, I'm 3,000 miles away, so I cannot come over there and stop you. But if you don't like it, I'm going to be mailing tofu to your house later this week. I'm going to add um, my lime here. And this is the end of the marinade that you will make if you follow the recipe. That said, I always respect going off recipe. But one of the ways that I really started to enjoy cooking when I was a kid was by going off recipe and just seeing what you could come up with. So I suppose it's, a, it's an art form and a creative license, right? That's right. Just going to show, I mean, I think it's really, a lot of people are afraid to cook because they think they're going to screw things up. Honestly, if you're cooking, I mean, baking, maybe you have to follow a few recipes, a few, few, few basic ingredients. But when you're cooking, right. everything goes. Right, Ali? I totally agree. I totally agree. That's why it's fun. And you really, you know, there are, there are a handful of things you can do to mess it up so badly you can't eat it. But it's worth the, it's worth the adventure to learn to enjoy it and you know, like one of the things when I write recipes and it says, you know, salt to taste or with pasta, cook it until it's done. Those are things that you inherently know just by being somebody who eats. You know what pasta tastes like. You know whether it's too crunchy or too soft. Um, you know if something is too salty or not. And even though there are lots of ways around that and, you know, you can add herbs and you can add citrus or vinegar if something doesn't really taste great rather than salt but it's it's an inroad that everybody has some experience with just by nature of having to eat every day so i think anybody can cook and more importantly anybody can learn to enjoy the process of it but take the take the stress level don't worry if you mess it up you can always eat something else there's always okay. something you can't fix in the kitchen just say All right. Dr. Austin, then we have a question in the chat what brand is your spatula? Uh, Laura's spatula? I don't think I used one yet. Dream Farm. Dream Farm. It's a teaspoon, and then you can scrape things off the bottom. It's such a cool little thing. I love it. And it's pretty cool. And you can put it like that, and it doesn't Oh, fall. okay. So you can, just, you can just park it on the side. And isn't it so annoying that you have spoons, and they fall over, and then they get the stuff all over the kitchen or wherever you are in the middle when you least want it. But yeah. this is great. Pretty clever. Last, you know, Ali, how I hate wasting food too, but you can get that last little bit of peanut butter, the last little bit yeah. of it off, out of the bottom. That. And it is especially good in the plastic containers. I love the glass peanut butter container because I can put it in the microwave, but the plastic ones I really can't. All right, I'm gonna move on to my, oh wait, actually I'm gonna grab my tofu. Okay, so this has been here. How long have we been talking? Like, here. So let me show you this crispiness. We can do like they do in the videos. You can see the like craggy edges. And I actually love all these little pieces that have fallen off to the side. Really, really good and tasty. And because there's nothing to really caramelize on here, it has ground a little bit but it's not like a golden brown because there's no sugar, there's no butter, there's nothing that would really change color that much, but you can see that it's darkened just a little bit. And the other cool thing about tofu is that it's not like you're cooking it till it's done. I mean, you could eat it raw out of the package, not that that would taste good, but you don't really have to worry about whether or not it's safe to eat all the way through. It's hot and it's crispy on the edges. So, we're gonna take this marinade. So now this was the one with a little bit of honey, lime and soy sauce. And I'm gonna to toss my tofu in there. And this is really where you're bringing all the flavor. Oh. And then you're gonna just let this sit. Now you could take a break and let this sit for a little while, but it, I find it really soaks it up, especially because we did that freezing step to get a lot of the other liquid out. And now you can kind of see it glisten. It's glossy. It's really good. And it's-, it's hey, Allie, I have to admit, it's absolutely delicious. Look at this, isn't that so cool? I use my peanut sauce, the whole thing dissolved, and my coconut, my peanut, chopped peanuts. Perfect. We brought some huge flavors to this. I'm changing my mind about tofu. This is like really, this is the way to do it. 
We've done it. I'm not even done with the recipe, but I'm ready. I'm hey, ready. I, I went wrong, but I have to tell you, I, I read through several little recipes online, and this was one of the suggestions at the back of one of them, so I didn't quite make it up myself, but pretty good. Michael, can you have me? Up? Well, I love so it. I was saying some more questions in the chat. What brand of tofu do you use? Many brands have Delta, Lactone, or other additives. I am very glad that you asked that question. I am actually using, whenever possible, Hodo Soy, H-O-D-O. They're actually um, Oakland-based. And the founder, I think his name is Min, he was actually, did a demo at Taste for the Cure maybe eight or nine years ago. Um, he is a fantastic human being and it makes me happy to support his business, but he's also making tofu very artisanally from scratch. He seeks out his own soybeans and they, they make even like, I for, actually forget the name of it, but they make like noodles from the skins of the process on the liquid after he makes the tofu and they've been around, they've been doing phenomenally and you can find them nationwide. So I'm over here in Rhode Island and I can actually find it now at my grocery store. Um, and it's really, there's almost no comparison. The actual taste of it is just so much better than most of what you find at the conventional grocery store. Um, if you're in San Francisco or another area that has great um, Asian markets, you could go there and get tofu too. There are lots of other brands that would also taste great. Um, but I tend to stick to Hodo Soy whenever I can. Actually, all the Gus's markets, so on Hate Street, there are uh, other one. They actually, Allie told me that they had it. So, and they did. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, I mean, my like generic, you know, Safeway equivalent grocery store all the way in Rhode Island carries it. So it's. They've done really well. I mean, it's a perfect example of a super unique product being done, you know, in a, in a great way that you just, it's so delicious. So it's, and it's not really even any more expensive than other tofus. It just is done really, really well. And you're supporting a great business. Okay. So the way I did this now, I put my liquid marinade on it. I chopped up my peanuts and coconut and it gives it you know, even more beautiful texture. And I'm gonna put this back in the oven for about two or three minutes. And because there's honey in there, what that'll do is help glaze the tofu. It'll toast the peanuts and toast the coconut. And it really brings like an interesting texture to it. And now, because it again has that sugar in there, now it'll get really golden brown. So last step, or I guess second to last step, let's whip up our mango salsa. Um, I also had trouble with mangoes. These are, my mango is really rough here. Oh, uh, you know what, Ali? I found, at Gus's, I found this uh, Coachella. Coachella mangoes. And they supposedly are less tough, less fibrous. I haven't actually tried them. I'm going to open them up and see. But I wanted to actually tell people about a little trick um, uh, for, for cutting, uh, for, for cutting uh, bell peppers. I actually yep. learned this from Tracy Desjardins when she was doing one of the Taste for the Cures. But when you cut it, you just cut this way, cut this way, cut this way, cut that way, and cut the bottom off, and you have all your pieces just like this that make it super easy to cut. It's a fantastic, easy way to cut um, a pepper. Perfect. I love that. So the good thing about um, this recipe and a less than wonderful mango, wait, let me see if I got this right. So I'm going down this side, this side, that side, just like that, huh? And you got that little knob on the bottom. No waste, look at that, that's pretty good, huh? Well, let's see, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do mine in a second. I have to just put my pepper in. So I'm gonna aim to oh, make, yeah. um, all of them sort of the same size. But as I was saying about the mango, the, the beautiful thing about, about turning a mango into salsa like this is that even if it's really not the most beautifully sweet, ripe mango that you would want to eat um, just on its own as a snack, we're gonna add so many other flavors and ingredients in here that it almost becomes a background texture, almost like a cucumber or something like that. And on that note, because my mango is not that great, I'm going to actually go a little rogue here and I'm going to add some tiny cucumber to my salsa. 
And I think I might even add, I have some little cherry tomatoes that I'm gonna add just to kind of bring more flavor. But basically the point of the salsa here is just gonna be um, for texture, for color. And really it's a great way to like pack in a big variety of fruits and veggies. So I'm Thanks, gonna do Jones. a little. Oh, I have to say, we have some questions in the chat for you as well. We have some questions from audience members wondering about tofu and soy products um, for ER positive breast cancer patients. Okay, I'll, I'll answer that. So the amount of that everyone can have, you just don't do anything to excess. The, the amount of tofu in the diet or in, in an estrogen in there is not enough to make any difference for people who have ER positive breast cancer. The most important thing you can do if you are a positive breast cancer is eat a diet rich in fr fruit and vegetables, not high fat, and really watch your weight. Um, I'm gonna show you my a trick that I learned. I'm from Miami, so there's lots and lots of mangoes, but this is a great way to do, uh, to cut mangoes and to get, them, to get them in. And I have to say these Coachella mangoes are unbelievable. The flavor is fantastic. And uh, so what I do when I have a mango is I'll take, I'll just take my knife and just go around the sides like this. And then just slice it like this and then do it this way across. And so you're basically doing that. And then when you put it into the, you can just sort of do it this way. And then you can just take your knife and just Scrape it right off and you've got your chopped mango for your mango salsa and you're all done. That's my favorite way to do mangoes. And I have to say, these are amazing. I've never had a Coachella mango. Supposedly cool. what makes them great is they have a smaller seed so you get more mango, less fibrous. Okay. And, and tangy, I've never had them. They are great. From Central California. My mango is still very sad, but it's gonna work and it's kind of uh, beautiful anyway. And then to the, the mango salsa, I'm going to add a pinch of salt and I'm going to add some lime. I'm going to pull out my tofu here and stir it one more time. So now since it had the marinade, it's kind of sticky and glazy on the bottom. Look at that. That looks great. Allison, we have another question about mangoes. So the attendee says sometimes when I can't find good fresh mangoes I use frozen ones and they're already cubed is that okay to use that is genius more than okay that's straight up brilliant I love it it's ready to go um especially you know for anything like this where you're adding other ingredients to it anything that's like the tofu anything that's been frozen and then defrosted will be a little bit softer because of the way um it reacts to the um the freezing process but i think for a salsa that i would much prefer to have good tasting previously frozen mangoes in here as well but when when you are putting them in a salsa i would let them defrost in a colander so that any of the extra water can drip out so you're not adding too much water to the salsa because you know like any good salsa or whatever it's made out of you want the the juices in the background to be really flavorful and not just um you know the defrosting component of the the mango but that's really smart. I like it a lot. So I'm going to add some lime to mine here. And let's see, I added salt. Okay, let's give this a stir. And I, I usually add a little bit of oil to it just to kind of bring it all together, but that's optional. But I think this looks beautiful. So again, I have tomatoes and cucumbers added to mine. You also I saw add, me- I added some uh, cilantro, Allie. I added cilantro and green onions. Oh, I'll have to do my green onions really quick. It's just, I love the variety of flavors. Um, and if you're looking to get more fruits and vegetables, this is a great way to do it. You could just eat this with chips. You could add black drained can of black beans in here and just eat this with chips. That would be amazing. Okay. Last step is the fun part. Dumbling. I wish I could turn this way. Okay, so I have a variety of options. You could use butter lettuce, which is usually called for when you do lettuce cups because it gives you a nice leaf shape. But um, sometimes I have a hard time finding it. 
Sometimes it comes with like the live roots at the bottom. It's just really dirty and you don't get a lot of pieces. And I don't usually have it around, um, but I do often have romaine. And I like romaine for this because you get kind of like nice boats. So you can do this as an appetizer like this. So you easily can get these like nice boat shaped pieces. So that would be romaine. The other one I have is iceberg, which I feel like is an often maligned lettuce. Everybody's everybody's always against iceberg, but it brings just a really mild crunch and it doesn't need to be the star of the show. And I like how super crispy and crunchy it is. And I also like how easy it is to get big cups and it's really inexpensive. Um, it's, it's great. So let's bring back the iceberg, huh? And then the third option that I really like is cabbage. I actually have a TikTok video that has two and a half million views about cabbage. So cabbage and I have a close relationship. I'm like singing the praises of cabbage anytime I can. So I really like cabbage for this. Um, and also you get big cuts. I would like cabbage, especially if you're going to serve this as an entree because it's a little bit heartier and you can do like a big cup rather than a small wrap. So let me show you how I'm going to do these. Actually, I have, so Ali, just to remind me, you put salt. Do you have to put oil? So here's my here's my special little squeezer. I love that for my salsa. Oh my god, these limes are horrible. If the limes are terrible, should you add a little lemon? You can add a little lemon. Yeah, I managed to get enough lime out of mine, but you could add lemon. You could almost even add like a tangy orange, like if you have a mandarin. But not to be tangy. You don't want sweet, right? Yeah, you, you want tangy, especially if your mangoes are really sweet. And because we had a little bit of honey in the um, in the peanut sauce. Okay, so I'm gonna show you real quick. We have, we have like two minutes left. If anyone else has any questions, go ahead and pop them in. But I'm gonna show you now with my tofu. So these are all crispy. I'm gonna make like a beautiful little bed of tofu. If you wanted to make this a meal and you wanted to add rice or rice noodles, it would be really fun to make a bed of rice or rice noodles and then put the lettuce cups on top of that. But this is also really great as an appetizer. Um, if you were having anybody over and serving this as an appetizer, the tofu does not need to be served hot. It still tastes great once it cools down to room temperature. And those are always the best kind of party appetizers or even meals because then you don't need to be in the kitchen while everybody else is at the party. Okay, we have a few quick questions while you're assembling. Okay. Um, one is parsley instead of cilantro. Sure, if you prefer parsley instead of cilantro, if you have the, it's like a genetic thing that makes cilantro taste like soap, you could definitely use parsley. You could also just double up on the green onions. Um, another great option for this would be basil. Great, another one is sort of yeah, what on. is between um, meat, substitute meats like beyond meat tofu um the question is really more about like i guess the beyond meat is it okay it's super processed sort of maybe what are the healthiest choices between those three well it's actually pretty healthy <laughs> and and we actually had people on about you know so beyond meat is made out of Soy that actually that Pat Brown, who is a breast cancer researcher, one of the actually the subtypes, the original molecular subtypes of breast cancer came out of Pat Brown's lab. He decided to take a sabbatical and learn about food science. And he in a year figured out what makes meat taste like meat. And he actually found, and it was heat. And he took small amounts of heme that he found in soy and he he uh, he upregulated those genes in soy. And that is really the basis for Beyond Meat. It's a plant-based uh, product that tastes like meat that actually helps us rely less on meat, which is good for the planet and good for your health. Um, so that's a pretty exciting, that's that's definitely a healthy alternative. It's not a processed thing. It's a good thing. It's a very healthy alternative. No one should be thinking that Beyond Meat or, you or, could easily... um, or Impossible or the Impossible, but it actually his is Impossible Foods, but regardless, they're actually plant-based alternatives. You could easily saute that and it crumbles up and it would have a similar texture to the tofu actually. So you could saute that with the same flavors. Um, I did actually earlier when somebody said about soy, though 
you know, Laura said you can eat it in moderation. If you wanted to avoid it in one place or another, you could use Bragg's liquid aminos, which is a common non-soy substitute for soy sauce in all recipes. Um, and if you didn't want to use the tofu, you could use fish or shrimp or so many other options here. You could use lean ground turkey or ground chicken, um, really a lot of options with this one. Um, so here I have them assembled. My peanut sauce was a little chunky when I went to, it was a little thick, so I just did a little spoonful of it. But you could thin that down with a little bit of water and squeeze it over the top and make cute little squiggles or whatever you like. But you can see how when you serve it in a cabbage cup, it sort of holds its shape a little bit, which I think is just a really fun and beautiful presentation. Let me get some light on there. So I, so Ali, I, I actually, you know, I forgot to put my jalapeno in my uh, mango salsa, but I actually put mine in my lettuce cup, my cabbage cups. I tried getting butter lettuce. That's an option if you want to yeah. a little bit in and roll it and eat it as a little appetizer. That could be a really fun thing to do. So like a little appetizer, right? Yep, this would be a beautiful appetizer plate. The other thing you can do, you want to really like hands off party serving thing is just line all these things up and make your guests do their own, right? You just yeah. get a long tray and put all four boats down and then let people serve their own. Here's an, here's, here's an example. If you just put in a little butter leaf, you can put it in, you can put a toothpick in it and serve it as an appetizer. Okay, Michael, now you have to eat it. That's for you. Another question about what could we substitute the crushed peanuts with? Um, you could use so many other nuts. I mean, you could use almonds, you could use cashews, would make a lot of sense. If you're going totally nut free, I would try sesame seeds. Even actually sprinkling black sesame seeds on the top would look really beautiful because it would pop. Oh my God, Allie, these are really good. Yeah, okay, so. Okay, and that's Michael eating tofu. That's amazing. That's Michael eating tofu and fruit on salad. So it's two wins. We have, I've, we've conquered the, uh, the uh, Essercott house here with this recipe. I, I can uh, sleep well tonight. <laughs> It's the peanut sauce, you know? It's like, it's just so good. No matter what you put it on, it's so good. Thank you so uh, much, Chef Allison. If there are any questions that come up, um, is there a contact that we should refer participants to? Probably the best place is to find me on Instagram. It's at ends and stems. And I know in all the literature um, that's tagged there. And my private messages are always open. So feel free to pop in and say hi. And if you make the recipe, send me a picture because I love to see it. And thanks everyone for, for joining in our great cooking class. Allie, I love it. It's fantastic. A tofu win, a salad, a, a fruit in your salad win. Nice and tangy, healthy, good and good for you. All right. So I mean, and I'll see you on the other side. And we'll all right. Enjoy the rest of your show. Thank you both. Thanks everybody for being here. Next, I want to uh, introduce Dr. Laura Vantveer, who is one of the premier molecular biologists in the world. She's one of the first people to have a, find a better way to classify tumors as fast growing and slow growing. Um, and we've actually worked together to find things that are ultra low risk and very, very slow growing. But she now has helped us through the iSpy trial find even better ways of characterizing tumors that really help us figure out who's going to respond to what. And we're testing these in our new iSpy 2.2 trial. And we're so excited to have her here to give you a taste of science. So Laura, the floor is yours. I think you're on mute, Laura. Yes, yes. Well, it's a little before I start, I hope you have leftovers and I'll come. Um, okay, I've got them all set, ready for you. Good. Um, well, thank you for giving me the floor to present some on new ways of characterizing breast cancer. Um, I always try to bring science to healthcare and I hope I will bring this to you as part of this taste for the cure. I'm faculty at uh, UCSF as well, 
and Laura Esselman and I are co-leading the, uh, the BRIS program. Besides working there, I also founded a company uh, and uh, I'm a part-time employee in Stockholm of Agendia and I'm a consultant in Stockholm for another biotech company, XI Bio. But I will not go into any details of what they're doing. I'm going to focus on the work we're doing here at UCSF. So when, when patients are diagnosed with breast cancer, of course, then the first question is what treatment? Um, and that question is based on when the disease is only in the breast, that's mostly curable by surgery and local radiotherapy. But if one or more tumor cells have already traveled further into the body, you want to prevent them to grow out and, and give a recurrence in the lung or the liver or the bone. So at the time of first diagnosis, many patients get medical therapies, drugs, to prevent the, the recurrence. But if you give those um, without knowing the tumor biology, then there is a risk of over-treatment, under-treatment, the wrong treatment, suboptimal. So there is many things one can do to learn about the biology of that first breast cancer uh, to actually give the most optimal treatment. That is something we have been doing in the iSPY breast cancer trial, which particularly enrolls patients that have a high risk for an early recurrence. So our, what we wanna do is we wanna prevent that early recurrence. And to get there, we wanna match the therapy, the choice of the therapy to the features of the derailed biology of the tumor of the patients that we can study and identify at time of diagnosis. So this is a study we've been working on since 2010. Laura Esman is the trial PI. I'm a co-PI and I oversee all of the biomarker work, which I will show to you today. So before I tell you how we're matching the best therapy to the, the status of the derailed biology, here is the basic principles of the iSPY trial. So you can see here that we test those drugs where they matter most. So we test them in the early stage uh, at the, the primary diagnosis, and we want to prevent metastases. We change the order of therapy, which was the standard, but more and more we're changing that to learn about response early in the course of care. So before surgery, so the systemic therapy, those drugs are given before surgery, and we're monitoring that at time of surgery, if there's any tumor left in the breast uh, by pathology, and if there's no left, that's called a complete response or PCR. And we use imaging, MRI. Those of you who maybe have participated in the iSPY trial know about this because there are several uh, MRIs during treatment. And we look at the biopsies of patients to identify the biology of the tumor. So as I said, we focus on patients who are at risk of an early recurrence and try to prevent. Um, and we, we graduate for efficacy and then the, the drug, if it's successful, needs to be tested in a follow-up trial. So our goal is to get all high risk for recurrence patients to a complete response on their first cancer to prevent these recurrences. And I'll show you in this next slide why that is important. So here we have, you see an evaluation of almost the first 1,950 patients who were treated in the iSPY trial. And of course, there is a group who has a complete response at surgery. And there is a group where we have not yet been successful. So they still have residual disease. So they do not have a PCR at surgery. And what we have learned that if you look at this timeline years after surgery, so if the surgery is at time zero, then you can follow each of the patients for two years, four years, six years, eight years, and beyond, depending when they were treated in iSPY. So somebody treated last year only has one year follow-up. Somebody treated in 2012 already has 10 years follow-up. So what you can see here, that patients who have a complete response at surgery, they stay 95%. So 95 out of 100 patients stay without recurrences at the three-year time point, the five-year time points, as far as, as, you can, as we can evaluate now. So that's what we want to do. We don't want to have any recurrence. 
patients in the trial so far who did not have a complete response, they have 81% unfortunately have a recurrence at three years, 70% at five years. Of course, when a recurrence occurs, new treatments can be used. So we can then improve survival, but we want to get rid of any patients without surgery. So we want to get everybody to this blue line. So in the drugs that are being tested in iSPY are shown here. So I told you that we're looking at the exact biology of the cancer. And this is a very famous slide. You may not immediately understand what you're looking at, but these are so-called hallmarks of cancer. And what e each of these little boxes represent is that you can have different derailed biology in the tumor cell of the breast cancer that actually cause the cell to continuously divide and become a tumor mass. So you can understand that if there is a continuous signal that the tumor cell needs to divide, that by itself already gives a tumor uh, to become larger and larger. So there are treatments here that particularly stop this signal. There are other treatments. So the tumor cells have become very clever. So your own immune, your own defense system in your body, your immune system, if there's something wrong in your body, you're actually, your body can react to that with their immune system to destruct it. But tumor cells has been so clever that they avoid this immune destruction. However, pharma and biotech scientists have become even cleverer again, and they have now generated treatments that can um, that in inhibit this avoiding the immune destruction, meaning that if a treatment with any of these drugs is given, your immune system is again able to destroy the tumor cells. And so there are more treatments. So these are the treatments we have been testing um, in, in iSPY, and I'll show you what we're doing to uh, identify the responders. So in the when you look at a tumor, you can first of all uh, identify if the tumor is high risk for recurrence by the mama print test. If the mama print is high, there's high risk for early recurrence. So those tumor patients with such a tumor are enrolled in the iSPY trial. Then up till recently, we just looked at the standard subtypes of breast cancer, for which many of you, I think, have, uh, if you had a diagnosis, you know, there, the pathologist looks at hormone receptor, whether it's present or absent or HER2, and that creates subtypes like hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, uh, everything positive or everything negative called triple negative or just HER2 positive. So these are the four subtypes that are used and were mostly used in, in uh, gu guiding treatment and that were used in iSPY up till recently, but let me tell you what we did up till now. So this is what we did up till now. It's quite a busy slide, but this shows you the standard subtype. So again, here we have from left to right, the hormone receptor, HER2 negative tumors, the triple negatives, the triple positives and the HER2 positive tumors. So every tumor that a patient gets diagnosed with is identified in either one of these four classes. So you can see here that all of these patients in the trial were treated with either standard chemotherapy listed here as control or up to nine different drugs. So there were seven used in the first box, seven in the second, and here for the HER2 positive, there was a selection and two specific. On the left side, you can see within such a subtype, receptor subtype, as we call it, what is the response rate? So meaning what percentage of patients shows a re response? So you can see that for the hormone receptor positive, it's particularly the, the, the Pembro drug, which is one of those immune modulating drugs that gives the best response. 30% of patients have a response. If you look all the way to the right, to HER2 positive, there's one combination of HER2 targeted drugs that gives 74% response. For the triple negatives here, the second box, there are two drugs that, that get to 50 or 60%. Uh, 
So you can see, depending on the subtypes, the drugs that are available right now have different success rates in the tumors subtypes by receptor as being tested. And where some go have a real great response. Remember, if you have a PCR that led to um, 95 out of 100 patients without disease after five years. So, but these drugs, as I showed you in a few slides back, actually um, are defined to attack a certain part of the biology. So what we did is that we uh, wanted to study if biomarkers, so markers of the tumor that are actually, as stated here in the middle, related to the mechanism of action of the a drug, like an immune modulating drug might work best if we have a um, biomarker that identifies the tumor as immune modulating sensitive or a, a DNA repair inhibitor drug may work best if we have an identifier that tells us that the DNA repair mechanism in that tumor is defective. So we, we qualified emerging biomarkers um, and we identified response predictive subtypes. And this is based that we want to find, can we more precisely identify responders? So one really busy slide before I show you the actual results. So you don't have to pick up any of this uh, besides, besides that we search for better biomarkers. We tested 27 qualifying biomarkers that are all related to mechanism of action of a particular drug. And if you see a big red dot means that we were successful in matching a therapy to a biomarker. Um, and that led us to create five response predictive subtypes that I'll show you in the next two slides. So we were successful in identifying biomarkers that can better predict response to this new uh, drugs. So the we had actually investigators worldwide working with us, um, and there were 75 biomarker proposals tested by our statistical and biological teams. And this yielded five response predictive subtypes. And the response prediction um, is used in, in the following, and when to use the following drugs, right? So if a tumor has immune oncology modulation biology, then you should use an immune oncology modulation drug. Um, when the tumor has DNA repair deficiencies, then you should use a DNA repair inhibition drugs. And so we were able to identify four, the first four subtypes where we actually know what, what drug to advise based on our research work. And, and the fifth subtypes, we actually, we, we did not identify much response and we are working on what actually else, what other therapy should we actually use? So in, in stepwise, if you look on the right side on this, um, this increase of response prediction overview, which is actually a summary of, of the complex part that is on the left, which we published this year in the journal Cancer Cell. So if you take standard chemotherapy, which is actually the black bar here, to all these patients and do not any subtype uh, selection, the response is usually between 20 to 25%. So one in four or one in five patients will respond. If the next bar is what iSpy did over time with targeted um, drugs on optimal receptor subtypes, we made that um, we made it to 35 to 40%. So more or less um, two in five patients would respond. What we have done now in, in two steps and look at the blue bar is that with those response predictive subtypes where we match a, um, a response predictive subtypes to a preferred um, drug, we think we can get to 60 to 70% and we're still refining our way of identifying that. And our goal is actually to get this bar up to 90% so that for every patient who is high risk recurrence, uh, we can give a recommendation of therapy. So in conclusion, um, 
the, the mantra of the ISPIRE trial is the right drug for the right patient at the right time. And of course, in, in breast cancer, we're used to stratify patients on receptor biology, as I showed you, hormone receptor HER2, and then test the drug, which leads to drug approvals by receptor subtypes. However, I showed you that tumors can have different biologies active, those hallmarks of cancer. And there is a need to come then look at tumors by drug response subtypes. And that would also allow physicians to prioritize the best performing drug for a patient's tumor biology. And actually in ISPY 2.2, uh, since June this year, we're now testing this concept. And all of that would not have been possible, possible with all the patients that enrolled in ISPY, the physicians from scientists and staff from 30 sites across the United States and 17 pharma biotech companies and the FDA. So thank you very much. Well, thanks, Laura, for a whirlwind tour. I think that, you know, it's when we do our taste for the science, we show you the science behind what we're doing. But the bottom line is we want to make it possible to go faster, you know, to get better options for patients at the time they need them most. And if we don't get the right response to be able to move on and treat in a different way, this is kind of a revolutionary new concept, but we are pretty certain that this is the way to get patients with high risk tumors um, to be cured of their disease before and know about it in time so that we make sure they don't get recurrence uh, and, and run the risk of dying of their disease. That's what clinical trials are for, to test these new ways of doing things. It's possible we're not correct. We obviously think we're right. Otherwise, we wouldn't be putting it forward in a trial. But again, that's what clinical trials are about. If you don't test new things, you don't have the opportunity uh, to ever do anything different. So that's the theme of our next section of this. And we're going to actually do a little uh, a quick lightning talks of uh, of six more trials, and then we're gonna have our panel to talk to you about trials and you're gonna have a chance to answer your questions. So let's move on to, um, let's move on to our next uh, uh, intern talk. Can you, uh, let's switch the slides now. And uh, we're gonna start actually um, with Somi Gotapati and she's gonna talk about um, women at high risk for breast cancer who actually are really suffering from hot flashes because we might have a trial that's right for you. Sue me. Thank you, Dr. Esselman. Uh, like Dr. Esselman said, my name is Somi and I'm gonna be talking about a trial that might be right for you if you're at high risk for breast cancer and have menopause symptoms like hot flashes. Um, next slide, please. Before we get into the details of the trial, we're gonna start by rewinding the clock a little bit and imagine that it's the year 2000 and that we know someone named Alice. So Alice is a woman in her 50s who like many other women in menopause transition is experiencing night sweats and hot flashes that really affect her daily life. She decides to go to her doctor and learns that her primary treatment option is hormone replacement therapy, which involves taking estrogen and sometimes progesterone to replace levels of these hormones in the body and treat menopause symptoms. But there is a catch here for Alice, which is that she's at high risk for breast cancer and taking hormone replacement therapy can actually increase that risk. Next slide, please. Fast forward a couple of years to 2013, and we have a new FDA approved drug called Duove. Duove is a combination of base dioxifene or BZA as well as conjugated estrogens, CE. By combining these two things, we're able to treat menopause symptoms and not increase breast cancer risk at the same time. How it does that is it acts like estrogen on places where your body needs it during menopause. So for example, the bone, which can lose density during this time, but it does not act like estrogen on the breast and the uterus, thereby not increasing risk for breast cancer. So, you might be thinking that we've solved Alice's problem, which we have, and that's really, really great. But fast forward to 2022, the present, and we have a new question. 
which is instead of just treating menopause symptoms and not increasing risk for breast cancer, can we actually treat these symptoms and also reduce breast cancer risk by using this combination of BZA and CE? Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> so that brings us to our up and coming clinical trial called the BZA plus CE trial. And the goal here is to determine if administering six months of BZA and CE significantly reduces breast cancer risk. This is determined by measuring breast density through periodic mammograms throughout the six months. The trial is for women who are ages 45 through 60 who are experiencing menopause symptoms and are also at increased risk for breast cancer. There are a couple more eligibility guidelines. For example, this trial is not for folks who have had invasive breast cancer in the past, but if generally what I've been talking about sounds like you and you're interested in receiving BZA plus CE for six months while also helping to determine if we can use it to decrease breast cancer risk, um, next slide, please. Please contact our clinical research coordinators, myself and Maeva at the email addresses listed on the screen. Um, I'll also put them in the chat afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Somi. That was uh, great. And we're really excited that trial should be opening in the next month. We're very excited to see if this is going to be, you know, an option for women that will not only reduce the risk, but reduce their symptoms of uh, some of the symptoms actually that can be generated by the other risk producing medications like tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitor. So we're really, really excited to have better options for people where we can really make prevention a priority, where it's really something that people want to take. Um, and it's a good thing to know that we're already finding that much lower doses of some of the standard things like tamoxifen, baby tamoxifen, baby exomestane, there are really good options for now for risk reducing that are uh, much, much, much more tolerable, but we want, we are not satisfied. We want to do more. Again, that's why we do trials. Okay, next up is Rachel Woody, and she's going to talk about another really exciting project we have about harnessing the immune system against high-risk DCIS. Again, not a very common type of DCIS, but one um, that we think is the riskiest that we may have figured out a solution for. Okay, um, Rachel, you're on. Thank you, Dr. Esserman, and thank you, Somi, for the wonderful introduction to the DUAV study. So here at UCSF, we see a very diverse range of patients and diagnoses. And so our physicians have developed some, a variety of innovative clinical trials to accommodate them. And today I'm excited to tell you about a clinical trial testing a new immunotherapy for women with ductal, cancer, ductal carcinoma in situ or DCIS. So first I'll explain who will benefit from this therapy. And then I'll talk about the thought process behind how it works. And finally, I'll explain what it looks like to participate in the trial. Next slide, please. So DCIS is characterized by tumor cells that are confined within the milk duct. And some women have a higher risk of these cells expanding beyond the milk duct and becoming invasive cancer. This high risk is characterized by HER2 positive cells, a high grade DCIS, a large palpable mass, and a young age at the time of diagnosis. So the objectives of this study are to reduce the size of DCIS in these patients and subsequently to reduce the size of surg surgical excision needed. And additionally, to bolster the immune system to prevent against future recurrences of DCIS and even instances of invasive cancer. Next slide, please. So how does this work? At the top of the screen, you can see two images of breast tissue. Stained in yellow are the tumor cells filling the milk ducts in the breast, and stained in pink and green are immune cells. And in patient six on the left side of the screen, you can see that there's a lot of immune engagement. We can even infer that these immune cells are trying to suppress and contain the DCIS in this patient. And so it will be predicted that this patient would respond well to the therapy because it will bolster her immune system and tip the scales in favor of the immune system to overcome the DCIS. And in the, indeed, this patient showed a very significant clinical response 
by MRI imaging in which there are not a lot of those pink and green immune cells working already. The immune therapy is not deemed sufficient to produce that same clinical response. So this therapy is really believed to work by tipping the scales in favor of the immune system. Next slide, please. What does it look like to participate in the trial? So first participants will undergo a screening and enrollment process. Here at UCSF, we really want to provide personalized care. So as part of this screening process, we will collect your tissue slides to make sure that you have a good chance of benefiting from participating in the trial. Next participants who are eligible will undergo two or four doses of treatment. And this takes the form of an intralesional injection directly into the DCIS. Finally, participants undergo a post-treatment MRI to observe their progress and then a surgical resection as needed. So this trial is very exciting for us because of its potential to bolster the immune system to reduce the size of surgery needed in women with high-risk DCIS, and additionally to bolster the immune system to prevent recurrences and instances of invasive cancer. If you're interested in participating or just learning more, I would be very excited to talk to you. My contact information is on the slide and you can also check out the clinical trials page on the UCSF website. Thank you. And thanks so much, Rachel, for that great presentation. And now we're gonna have Sarah Nath and Kami Pulakandam talk about iSpy 2.2. You heard a little bit about this already from Laura Vanfier, so you'll at least have a, uh, uh, you know, some good idea of what we're trying to do, but this is about another step forward in personalizing the treatment for women with high risk stage two and three breast cancer. Take it away, you guys. Thank you, Rachel, for providing insight into a trial option for patients with DCIS. Continuing on with our discussion of innovative treatments for patients with different types of breast cancer, we will talk to you today about the iSpy 2.2 trial. Next slide, please. To start, iSpy has four main goals. The first is to individualize patient care through within a trial through personalized therapies. We'll talk more about this later, but iSpy patients are matched to treatments based on their unique tumor biology. The second goal of iSpy is to get as many patients as possible to a complete response or close. Patients achieve a complete response when their tumor completely disappears before they undergo surgery. In the past, 19 to 40% of iSpy patients have achieved a complete response. But with the new information we now have, we predict that 60% of patients on iSpy 2.2 will achieve a complete response or their tumor will completely disappear. The third goal of iSpy is to minimize toxicity and maximize patients' quality of life. Through frequent monitoring and leveraging new drug combinations, iSpy stays patient-centered. And finally, iSpy's unique ability to personalize patients' treatments and adapt these therapies to patients' unique responses allows us to achieve our final goal, ensuring the right treatment for the right patient. Next slide, please. So how is this accomplished? Through personalization and adaptivity. To give you an idea of what the trial is, it's just showing a simplified schema. Now, it can be a bit overwhelming, but I like to say that it's because there are a lot of options, and more options means more personalization. This trial begins with a screening process before the patients are adaptively randomized to their arms. They are then given three blocks of treatment, some FDA-approved experimental, and some standard of care that have been selected in the manner of precision medicine. Throughout treatment, there are overall also several early surgery opportunities that allow patients to avoid unneeded chemos and treatments that they may have had to get in standard of care. In addition, there are MRIs and biopsies throughout that monitor the patients and allow them to move on to the next treatment option if they're not responding. Each patient gets treatment that is personalized to their tumor type and response. Next slide, please. Personalization in the iSpy trial involves individualizing care for each patient, utilizing prior data from previous versions of the study to inform the personalized treatment and ensure the right treatment for the right patient. No two cancers are the same and no two people are the same. So why should we give everyone the same treatment? Next slide, please. One method of our personalization is through the response predictive subtype, which is a new way to define one's cancer. Typically, when someone is diagnosed with breast cancer, their subtype is found through the receptor status. If they are positive or negative for estrogen, progesterone, or HER2 receptors, this is the standard subtyping. And it's like your classic ice cream flavors, chocolate, strawberry, or vanilla. However, 
iSpy has further developed these subtypes into more than just three. And like there can be more than three ice cream flavors, there's more to a tumor than just these receptors. So iSpy created the response predictive subtypes, which are using additional biomarkers, such as immune response, to further define the, the type of cancer. Next slide, please. Once found during screening, these response predictive subtypes then define drug selection. Experimental and standard of care drugs are selected using the response predictive subtypes, allowing for personalization based on a more detailed classification. Next slide, please. Moving on to adaptivity in I5, this accomplishes our goals of minimizing toxicity, maximizing quality of life, and again, ensuring the right treatment for the right patient. Next slide, please. To further contextualize this discussion, I would like to start off by understanding what standard of care has to offer. Typically, for patients receiving breast cancer therapy before surgery, they will receive two MRIs, one before treatment and one before surgery. Next slide, please. But iSpy is different. As you can see, not only does iSpy scan patients before treatment and before surgery, like that of standard of care, but also at crucial time points through all blocks of treatment. The six-week MRIs occur in the middle of a treatment block, and they allow patients and physicians to understand the tumor's response while patients are receiving their unique therapy. The 12-week MRIs occur at the end of each treatment block, and they allow patients and physicians to understand the total effect of the treatment that patients have received. These 12-week MRIs are paired with biopsies, so patients and physicians can gain greater insight into the tumor's characteristics on a cellular level. Next slide, please. These MRIs not only inform patients about their treatment responses, but they also serve as unique opportunities for patients to modify their treatment timeline. If the six-week MRIs show a poor response to treatment, Patients don't have to finish out the rest of the block. They can just skip on to the next one. And if the 12-week MRI shows a great response, patients don't have to continue receiving therapy. They can go straight to surgery. Thus, not only are the treatments themselves adapted to patients' unique tumor biology, but the treatment timeline adapts to unique tumor response. Next slide, please. So what goals are achieved? iSpy minimizes toxicity quality of life in two ways. First, patients start with treatments that are less toxic, like those in block A, and move to stronger therapies only as needed. This reflects iSpy's mission of staying patient-centered. Furthermore, frequent opportunities allow for early surgery opportunities that ensure that patients are not over-treatment, over-treated, again, ensuring a, a high quality of life. iSpy also ensures the right treatment for the right patient. If a treatment is working, patients can stay the course or move on to surgery early. And if a treatment isn't working, patients can move on to a different therapy quickly and efficiently. And what's great about the trial is that the three types of therapies present in block A, block B, and block C means three opportunities for a patient to shrink the tumor and a greater likelihood of a complete response. Next slide, please. Is I spy for you? You can learn more at clinicaltrials.gov, or you can visit our website, ispypatient.org. You can all also call us or email us at the following contacts. Thank you. Well, fantastic job describing that complicated trial, but we're so excited. This involves everybody uh, in our breast care center and so many people across the country. We're excited to move the field forward. Okay, so now we're going to hear about uh, Firdos Mujira, and she's going to talk to us about the two different types of invasive cancer, lobular and ductal. Are they different? And what have we learned? Okay, take it away, Firdas. Thank you, Dr. Osterman. And thank you to Kami and Sarah for giving insight into cancer subtypes. To follow, I'll be giving a little deeper analysis into the types of breast cancer, specifically lobular and ductal cancer. Next slide, please. Invasive ductal carcinoma is the predominant form of breast cancer making up 80 to 90% of all breast cancers, while invasive lobular carcinoma is the second most common type. The key difference between these two types of cancers is in the presence of the protein e cadherin This protein is what we call an adhesion molecule, and its presence in ductal cancer causes the tumor cells to stick together to form round masses that resemble milk ducts, which are the purple dotted round structures we see in this top image. Lobular cancer, however, lacks this protein, 
leading these tumor cells to become scattered throughout a region of the breast in single file patterns, which we can see in the rows of purple dots in the bottom image. This difference in structure makes lobular cancer uniquely hard to treat, especially because most current treatments are designed with ductal cancer in mind. Next slide, please. These challenges in treating lobular cancer start before diagnosis. The scattered pattern of the cancer cells means it's harder to see the tumor when imaging the breast, leading to potentially false negative mammograms or only being able to diagnose a tumor once it reaches a higher stage. The scattered pattern also means it's harder for surgeons to remove all of the tumor at surgery, leading to a higher likelihood of additional surgeries for patients with lobular cancer. Lobular cancer also responds less to standard systemic therapies and there are currently no therapies that specifically targets this type of cancer. Next slide, please. Knowing the challenges in treating lobular cancer, UCSF is dedicated to finding solutions to these issues through research with our lobular research group led by Dr. Rita Mokhtar. This research includes maintaining a database of patients with lobular cancer that are treated at UCSF in order to better understand their treatment outcomes as well as ongoing clinical trials to find the most effective imaging techniques and systemic therapies to diagnose and target lobular cancer. Next slide, please. To conclude, invasive lobular carcinoma is unique from invasive ductal carcinoma, which creates challenges in treating it as most current therapies and techniques are designed for ductal cancer. However, there is ongoing research with hopes to improve treatment and surgical outcomes for patients with lobular cancer with the ultimate goal of preventing recurrence and mortality. To learn more about lobular cancer, research in this field, and patient advocacy, please visit the UCSF Lobular Research Group website or the Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance website using the QR codes on the slide or the links in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ferdos. And we're gonna move right along to talk about another trial we have called the Clear Edge trial and an opportunity that we have to try and figure out how to get people clear margins in the operating room. So we're going to hear about that from Kevin John. Kevin? Thank you, Dr. Esterman. And hello, everyone. My name is Kevin. And the question that I'll be answering today is, can everyone have clear margins after surgery? I'll be diving into how the clear edge trial could potentially help address this question. Next slide, please. Just as for those previously discussed in her presentation, I will be going over what margins are and why they are important. A margin is the edge of a tissue removed during surgery and is put into two categories, negative or positive. As you can see in the picture here, the, pic the pink is the normal breast tissue and the white is the tumor tissue. In the image where it says negative, you can see that the white or the tumor is nowhere near the edge of the margin. We could categorize categorize this as a negative margin. On the other hand, on the image where it says positive, you could see how the white or the tumor is reaching all the way to the margin or the edge. So we call that a positive, positive margin. A positive margin means that it's possible, though not necessarily true, that there may be some tumor left behind. And currently, around 20% of breast conserving surgery is repeated due to positive margins. Next slide, please. There's lots of things that we already do here at UCSF to reduce tumor being left behind and to reduce the likelihood of a re repeat surgery. During the surgery, the breast surgeon conducts a visual and palpitation exam and also takes a picture of the tissue with an x-ray device, as you can see in the middle, to better assess the margins of the tissue that has been removed before the pathologist looks at it after surgery. In addition to the already existing technology, we are testing to see if a device called ClearEdge can further assist the surgeon in reducing tumor being left behind and the likelihood of repeat surgery. Next slide, please. So what is ClearEdge? ClearEdge is a handheld device that helps the surgeon visualize abnormal and normal tissue. Once the surgeon removes the tumor and it comes out onto the back table, the surgeon can utilize the device to look at the edge of the tissues taken out. If it looks like there's tumor on the edge, then the surgeon can utilize the information provided by the device, along with the other tools that we use here at UCSF to take an additional margin. Next slide, please. Here's a quick comparison in the difference between our current standard of care and what you can expect if you're enrolled in the clear edge trial. The first row represents what we do currently. Once the surgeon removes the tumor, it will be sent to the pathology lab where your pathologist will determine if the margins are positive or negative. If you're enrolled in the 
clear edge trial, the device will be used during your surgery and the same tissues will be sent to the pathology lab for analysis. And previous studies have shown promising results in using the device where the rate of positive margins is significantly reduced. And here at UCSF, we are helping to test this research in a big multi-centered study. Next slide, please. So can you enroll? If you're a patient diagnosed with breast DCIS or invasive cancer recommended for a lumpectomy procedure, please ask your surgeon or reach out to Dr. Jasmine Wong via email. Additionally, you could reach out to me or Mina, who are the study coordinators for this clinical trial. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much. And we're excited. We're going to open this trial next week. So I'm going to try it for the first time next week. I'm very excited about it. I hope it works. Okay, we're going to move on to Catherine Lou Dugan, who's going to talk to us about precision radiation and how we can make it more effective and reduce side effects. Thank Catherine? you, Dr. Esserman. So you've now heard how we are personalizing our systemic treatments and surgery to be precise. I'm going to tell you about how we are personalizing radiation, another modality we use to treat cancer. Next slide, please. The word radiation can sound really scary, but it can help to think of it as very similar to light. Much like light, radiation is a form of energy. The way that radiation therapy works to treat cancer is by directing energy beams at the cancer target. But how do we make a plan that can safely treat the cancer while minimizing risks to healthy cells? Today, I will talk about three ways. The first, by using the right kind of beams. Second, by sending those beams from the right origins. And third, by delivering those beams to the right target. A radiation oncologist's job is to make a plan that sends as much radiation to the cancer while sending as little radiation to healthy tissue as possible. Next slide. Just like light through water, different kinds of radiation beams can travel to different depths of tissue. Imagine our bodies are like the water in this picture. When we want to treat something deeper in the body, we need to use a higher energy beam like the sun to make sure that the energy reaches the cancer we are trying to treat. When we treat something closer to the surface, we can use a lower energy beam like the moon. Next slide. In these images, imagine the cancer is the street and we want to make sure the street has adequate light. If we use one light, like the picture on the left, that light needs to be really bright. But if we use multiple lights, like the picture on the right, each light can be dimmer and we can create the same effect in the end. Just like these lanterns, we use multiple beams to deliver radiation treatment too. The beams are sent from the right origins to make sure that the multiple beams converge at the cancer. Next slide, please. For every person and for any stage of cancer, the radiation plan is personalized to your body and your tumor. To do this, we use imaging at every step. On the left, you can see a CT machine, one that you might be familiar with. This is what we use in the planning phase to get a better picture of your cancer and its relationship to your healthy tissue. On the right, you can see a radiation machine. What might be harder to tell is that there is a mini CT scanner in this device too. During the treatment phase, the radiation therapists take an image each day to confirm that your setup is perfect. Only then is your radiation plan delivered. Next slide. So radiation therapy can be a really important part of your cancer treatment. The radiation oncology team makes and delivers radiation treatment plans that use the right kind of beams delivered from the right origins and delivered to the, to the right target. Next slide, please. To learn more, you can visit this website. To meet with a breast radiation specialist at UCSF, please call this number. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine. That was terrific and helps us really understand what's behind these different modalities of treatments. And we're gonna finish with Mina Mustafa talking to us about a tool that we've built uh, called breastcancertrials.org. And again, clinical trials are tomorrow's treatments today. So how do you find the one that's right for you? Mina, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Esterman. So throughout uh, this morning, uh, my colleagues have been going through many wonderful programs and clinical trials at the, here at the Breast Care Center. And I'll be briefly going through how you can find one that is right for you. Next slide, please. First, why are clinical trials important? 
So there are key, there are two key uh, main points here. The first is that clinical trials are important to advancing cancer care. Uh, clinical trials allow physicians and researchers to really study breast cancer prevention, as well as breast cancer diagnosis and treatment. And importantly, clinical trials also allow uh, physicians and re researchers to address the needs of breast cancer survivors. An additional benefit of clinical trials is that patients are allowed to receive innovative treatments, and these include experimental drugs and therapies um, that can be key when standard therapies are no longer effective on certain patient populations. And I'll be briefly going through uh, the breast cancer uh, clinical trial matching process via breastcancertrials.org. Next slide, please. So how does breast cancer trial matching work? Essentially, you provide some information about yourself and some information about your cancer, and that allows for breast cancer trial matching. So some materials that can be helpful in this process uh, include your pathology report, breast cancer staging information, imaging reports, et cetera. And the key here is that the more information you provide, the more specific the match will be. And that leads us to uh, the first step in this process. Next slide, please. So the first step is essentially entering your breast health history on the easy to use forms that are available on the breastcancertrials.org website. So these questions comprise your diagnosis information, uh, cancer location, other such uh, information. And essentially here, the more information, the better. Uh, next slide, please. The second step is the, sorry, previous slide. Yes. The second step is the most important step, which is, of course, receiving the list of trials that are uh, apt to your particular health situation. And what's important here is that there is no one size fits all. Essentially, the more personalized information that you provide, the more personalized your match will be. And this is really important because it's not like everyone would be getting the same exact list of trials as you. It's really personalized to you and that allows you to get the uh, best treatment possible. Uh, next slide, please. The final step is essentially uh, receiving all the research sites, uh, location contact information that uh, are apt for the list of clinical trials that you received. And what's cool here is that you can sort of zoom out or zoom in as much as you'd like. So for example, you can uh, narrow your search history or your search radius to uh, within 15 miles of San Francisco or 50 miles of San Francisco, however you would like. Um, and so the, the three main steps here are essentially filling out your health history, receiving the clinical trial list, and then narrowing your scope however you would like. For more information, please visit breastcancertrials.org. Thank you. And thank you so much. Um, uh, for that great presentation, Mina, and we're going to move right on to our final, last but not least, but our, our panel discussion about why clinical trials matter for everyone, from screening and prevention to stage four disease. And we have a fantastic okay. group of panelists um, that we're that we are uh, that uh, will discuss this for you, and we will have Dr. Hope Rugo, who is um, one of the premier breast on medical oncologists in the world. Um, we're fortunate to have at our breast care center, Dr. Nicholas Prionis, who is a fantastic radiation oncologist, also very well known in his field and really interested in advancing the field to provide more effective, less toxic therapy to everyone. Dr. Sarah Horton, who is also a medical oncologist, uh, but someone who's really focused on uh, how do we increase uh, the enrollment among diverse populations, and she works with Quantum Leap Healthcare uh, Collaborative, which is the sponsor of the iSpy trials. Uh, and then finally, we have our own Allison Stover Fiscalini, who is the executive director of the Wisdom Study and also the Athena Breast Health Network. So I'm going to start with each one of you, just starting with a little bit about you know, why you think trials in your field matter. So Hope, I'm going to start with you. Well, or thanks, uh, and thanks for this excellent program today, and congratulations to the interns for their fabulous presentations, and all of you who are listening, your questions have been incredible, incredibly insightful and great, uh, so nice to have us think, too. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about clinical trials, and that's for a specific reason. Uh, we can change the outcome of this disease 
through clinical trials. And these aren't just clinical trials looking at new agents, although that's a big focus for us, but these are clinical trials, as you heard, looking at exercise, looking at reducing toxicity, looking at improving quality of life. We can't ever make a step forward without a clinical trial. And just to give you some examples, we have recently discovered, rediscovered a new class of drugs that seems to really have rocked our world. Uh, these are called antibody drug conjugates, and they're a new way of delivering chemotherapy using an antibody to target that payload, a tiny bit of potent chemotherapy directly to the cancer cell. What we learned recently was we already knew cancer cells like to stick together. They are good bedfellows. And if the payload, the chemo, can leak out through the membrane of the cancer cell, it can kill nearby cells and have a bystander effect. That means that you wouldn't even need a cancer that had the protein the antibody is targeted to highly uh, present on that cancer cell. So what happened with this? In HER2 positive disease, we have a new antibody drug conjugate that has had a bigger effect than we could possibly have imagined in metastatic breast cancer and is now being tested in early stage disease. We have two approved antibody drug, drug conjugates for uh, patients with a variety of subtypes of metastatic cancer that have both improved survival, which is a huge endpoint for us. And then we're testing these agents in early stage disease. In fact, a, two very interesting and cool antibody drug conjugates are in iSpy2 now, and we're already seeing shrinkage of cancers, and we're looking at making the side effects better too. So clinical trials are the are incredibly important. And sometimes people in the metastatic setting say to me that they understood that you wait to do a trial until you have no other options. And it's just the reverse. iSpy2 is a great example of that. Drugs work better when you have less prior treatment. Starting at the beginning is the best. And if you have metastatic disease, the earlier you can access these drugs, these trials, the better off we all can be because we're all helping you to do better. Thank you so much, Hope. Um, um, I'm going to now turn to, uh, I couldn't agree with you more, and I'm going to turn now to Sarah Horton and, and ask you why you are actually so interested in trials, and in particular, why you think it's so important to make sure that we make more of an effort to make sure that trials include um, the diverse population in the United States. Sarah, you're on yeah. mute. Kyle, can you unmute her? Is that possible? I think she might have the wrong, doesn't have her speaker turned on to the right. Um, you yeah. have to talk. Sarah needs to can you hear change. Me yep. Yeah, there we, we go. can hear you. Great. Okay. Got it. Okay. Sorry about that. I was just saying thank you for having me here today. This is a great meeting. Um, and so your question about uh, clinical trials and why it's important to have uh, inclusive and diverse populations is something, of course, that's near and dear to me. Um, uh, should I do a little introduction or should I just go straight to the, the question? I, I think I, I did a little introduction of you while you were joining. Okay, thanks. So, so as you know, um, that's kind of the role that I have, and I've all, in most of my career, I've been working towards uh, health disparities, which is the difference in how different populations respond to different treatments. And one of the things that we know in breast cancer is that as a group, um, African American or Black women with breast cancer um, live as a whole less when you compare them to other types of women. And we call that a health disparity because uh, they, as a group, they don't get the cancer as often. So something's going on there uh, that we need to really focus on to figure out why the response to the treatments aren't as, it may not be as good or why the women aren't living longer. So the only way that we get to find out the answers to these questions are through clinical trials. And we know that certain drugs work very well in certain situations because they've been tested in clinical trials. And unfortunately, historically in the past, there have not been a there has not been a lot of diversity differences in the type of people who are who have been on clinical trials because clinical trials are things that um, 
you need to be made aware of. And then you also have need to be comfortable saying, yes, I want to be a part of that. So um, our push at Quantum Leap and across the country and the world now is to, to educate um, all people, especially people who have cancer. For us, women with breast cancer, uh, working on, I work on the iSpy trial, so it's important for us to make a point of not only asking um, the places that have the study open now to try to encourage all types of people, including people of color to be on this study, but also to look beyond the sites that we have now and look at places where these you know, people tend to get their care that may not have clinical trials. And so that, I guess, is a long answer uh, to your question, but the only way that we're going to find out how these drugs work in different populations is to have those type of people on the clinical trials. And so um, we're just trying to get better at that. Great, thank you, Sarah. And um, Nicholas, uh, perhaps you tell us a little bit about what makes, what, why, why you think trials matter in, in radiation oncology. Absolutely. Um, first off, it's a real honor to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, broadly speaking, clinical trials are our gold standard. And it's how we move forward as uh, a field. Um, and that's particularly true in radiation oncology, but all of cancer uh, therapy. Um, and I think it's one of the most altruistic things someone can do as a, as a patient or a person going through a cancer diagnosis and treatment. Not only does it give you access to new opportunities, new technologies, and new techniques, it is generating knowledge that's going to help uh, countless numbers of people in the future. Um, there's no greater service, in my opinion. Uh, broadly speaking, I think there are some, some categories or buckets of um, knowledge that we can gain from clinical trials and radiation therapy. We can identify who benefits the most from treatment and therefore should undergo radiation treatment versus maybe who derives a smaller benefit and could potentially forego radiation treatment. Um, foregoing is the ultimate de-escalation of radiation treatment, but there are other ways to de-escalate that we can learn about through trials, whether that's treating less of the body, like part of the breast as opposed to the whole breast, or using smaller doses or, or less radiation in total. Um, some of these new regimens that we're evaluating potentially increase access to care. So that's another way that through trials, we can um, help people more broadly. And then there are studies that are looking at novel ways to use radiation. So that maybe um, it's not just after surgery or not just for a local benefit, but maybe something more uh, broad. Um, and then lastly, I think we've done a great job of overlaying uh, the patient experience onto all the trials that are being done. So patient reported outcomes to really understand um, what the personal impact, the side effects, the experience are for people who are going through, through these treatments. Uh, so a lot to learn. And again, thank you to everybody who participates in these trials. It's, it's just deep altruism. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Nick, Nicholas. And, and you know, I want to say not only is it deep altruism, but actually, trials are a way of getting better care yourself, as, as you know, Hope was pointing out. You know, this is, again, I always like to say, trials are tomorrow's treatments today. And, you know, I think this is something that people don't realize that it really is an opportunity to change your own care. It, there's always some risk. If we try something that's less intense, there's a chance that maybe that's not as good, but there's a chance actually that it's better. You know, if we didn't do trials, we would still be doing Halsted radical mastectomies, seriously. And and that's 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 the truth. And in surgery, we have you know seriously de-escalated. So you know, doing lumpectomies, doing you know ta taking out fewer and fewer uh, lymph nodes, and you know even finding you know situations when people are older where they don't need radiation this is really this is really better for you and if people didn't participate in these trials we'd never have the answer to these questions so allison i'm going to turn to you and ask you why in the field of screening and prevention why why you know why is it that you're excited about trials sure. well thanks for having me today and it's nice to see everyone um, so I'm Allison Fiscalini, and I'm the director of the WISDOM study, which is a national breast screening trial, so for women who have not had a diagnosis of breast cancer. And really what we're trying to learn and understand is how do we understand who's at risk for breast cancer, and more specifically, who's at risk for what types of breast cancer. As you've heard today, there are lots of different types of breast cancer. There are many, many different risk factors, and we're trying to put it all together to understand how can we screen and prevent breast cancer. Um, with this study, because it's for healthy women or for women who don't have a diagnosis, there is no drug or treatment that's being tested. And so just to make the point that 
research and trials don't always mean that there's a drug or that always means that there's an intervention that um, you know you have to you have to be tested for. Um, and so the we're trying to understand the risk factors is really what we're trying to do in the wisdom study. Um, additionally, you know, looking to see who's at risk for perhaps uh, some of the different types of breast cancer, even DCIS, and seeing uh, future trials if there are ways to look at prevention strategies, including active surveillance, particularly for those women who uh, may have hormone positive uh, DCIS. So there's lots of different trials that are out there. It doesn't mean you have to have a diagnosis. Um, I know many times people ask, how can I support someone who I know has had breast cancer, I know is going through breast cancer. And often what we say is, you know, there are many things you can do, do to support them on a day-to-day -day basis, but contributing to the science and contributing to the research so that hopefully another person doesn't get diagnosed or we can identify someone at risk who may need additional screening and may need um, some prevention that can help reduce that risk of breast cancer. That is great. Thank you so much, Allison. Okay, so now we're going to do another little lightning round for each one of you. And I want each of you to talk about one or two trials that you are particularly excited about, or it could be a trial approach that you think is really exciting and why you think that's going to contribute to the field. So Hope, we're going to go back to you to open this up. Uh, sorry, can you state the question again that we're addressing? Yes. So talk about one or two trials that you're really excited about that you think you know, has potential to change the field. I mean, there's of course many, I know you're interested, you know, but I'm gonna just give us your top two. I, I'll focus on two different areas. We've talked a lot about iSpy and of course we're all passionate about that trial. So I won't mention that as my number one, but in the metastatic uh, setting, we're looking at antibody drug conjugates and one series of studies are looking at an antibody drug conjugate called, it has a long name, so bear with me, datopotamab deruxtecan. And we're looking at that in both hormone receptor positive and triple negative breast cancer. Uh, we're also looking at another antibody drug conjugate, sasetuzumab govotecan. Again, these all have terrible names, but the brand name for sasetuzumab is Trotelvi. And uh, as first line treatment for triple negative breast cancer in combination with another immune therapy, which is very, very interesting. So that sort of set of trials, I think has huge potential for changing the way we treat patients. The second sort of set of trials is in the early stage setting where we have patients with hormone receptor positive disease, we have a really hard time predicting who's at risk for a late recurrence. And one area that we're looking at is trying to change the endocrine therapy that patients take at five years to try and further reduce that risk and better understand risk as well. That's great. And so, um, uh, Right, and the exciting thing is that some of the drugs that that uh, Hope mentioned, we're trying to bring even earlier into the high risk early stage setting through iSpy. So Sarah, you might want to talk about some of the approaches to trials that you think might make a difference in you know really being more welcoming or uh, or, or make trials more accessible and possible for for women who uh, are getting treated in areas where there's fewer resources for trials. Okay, well, um, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about this uh, and put a lot of attention towards looking at the barriers that different sites and different patients have in getting on trials. And so um, one of them is where patients actually get their care. And most clinical trials are at um, what we call big academic centers like universities. Um, but most of the people who are diagnosed with cancer get their care in the community setting. And so we're looking at ways of possibly partnering some of the centers with um, academic centers to try to um, allow those places, the, the community centers, to actually have the trial open so that their patients don't have to travel to a university setting. Um, we're also looking at making um, ways that the patients have less of a burden when they are enrolled on a clinical trial. So for example, of course, uh, transportation has always been um, an issue. So looking at ways to supplement the patient um, either by you know, vouchers or uh, connecting or partnering with different transportation um, ways to get the patient's access. 
We're also um, trying to make sure that the patients are not um, kind of turned off by uh, fears of financial issue, um, financial, what we call toxicity, that they think that being on a study is going to be more costly. And so we're looking at developing a navigator, like we have patient navigators now in cancer centers just to help guide a patient through that whole kind of um, journey through getting their care, want, we would like to get navigators to sit down with the patient and say, see what it looks like in terms of cost, even before you start. And if there is a gap or, a, or an issue with their insurance where they're, they're not being able to pay as much, finding resources in the community to support the patients in that way. And so it's kind of a multi-pronged approach at looking at how to support not only patients, but also the sites uh, so that, that more people who historically haven't been able to um, be involved with clinical trials, either because of their concerns or because where they get their care um, aren't able to support it, uh, can do so. Um, thanks, Sarah. That is great. And we, we certainly are excited to partner with you to really make, make those changes. And you know, uh, as part of the moonshot, um, when, um, Joe Biden was vice president, now he's president, but as part of that, they got a, an agreement from Uber and Lyft to provide free rides to cancer patients to their appointments. And uh, we should, we'll find out exactly how we do that and make sure that it's still active because I think that's that there are, it's as usual, there are often resources that are available. We just don't know about it, don't know to tell people how to access them. So super important points. So Nicholas, Dr. Prionis, I am going to turn to you. What trials are you excited about every day? I'll talk about two big categories. The one is this concept of hypofraction or hypofractionation or ultra hypofractionation, which just means we're going to shorter and shorter number of treatments needed to treat a, a given person. A little more radiation per day or fewer treatments. And the other big category is the role of radiation um, with the immune system. So the first big category, uh, we've come to appreciate and learn that certain types of cancer like breast cancer may actually be more sensitive to giving a, large, a larger amount of radiation per treatment. And that means we can do that over a smaller number of treatments. So the days of five or six weeks of radiation treatment, you know, 25 to 33 treatments are becoming less common. Now, standardly, you'll hear about three weeks of, of radiation treatment after lumpectomy uh, or potentially even as short as one week. And that's exciting because it really increases access to care. Um, it was a burden previously for patients to be able to present for their treatment, to show up for treatment for six whole weeks. And now we can really uh, help more people. But at the same time, we've come to find out that giving that larger amount of radiation per treatment actually has a benefit in terms of side effects. So we're seeing fewer side effects as we sort of truncate uh, the, the treatments. And that's very, very exciting for us. The second group I would uh, uh, kind of emphasize is the role of radiation with the immune system. And we're in just really early years of understanding um, the interplay between radiation and chemo and immunotherapies and their impact on the immune system. So there are really exciting trials looking at giving the combination of chemo and immunotherapy and radiation prior to surgery to see if we can rev up or prime the immune system to, to, to achieve better uh, opportunities and chances for a complete response and, of course, better um, clinical outcomes. So uh, like I said, we're just learning now, and it's going to be a long process to, to optimize the interplay of these different treatments, but there's a lot of opportunity there. Great. Okay. And Allison, we're going to ask you, what are the trials you are excited about? And I'm going to remind the, the audience while we're doing this to uh, put your questions into the um, Q&A box and start asking uh, questions and for uh, the panelists on any topic. And uh, Laura Vanfield will read out those questions when we're ready. Okay, so uh, we're not quite ready for that, uh, Rajna. We're, we're not quite there. I'm going to have Allison finish. Okay, I just wanted to get people thinking about it and getting their, their questions on. Okay, Allison. So I'm, of course, uh, really excited about the wisdom study, which has been going on for several years, but I'd say what's even more exciting coming up is thinking ahead to what can wisdom do next and what we call wisdom 2.0, which is really trying to identify women at risk at younger ages. We know many women who are diagnosed in their 30s, sometimes even younger, but our current screening guidelines don't recommend screening for most women um, under the age of 40, sometimes even 50. 
So I'm really excited to launch the next phase of the wisdom study, which is to really understand breast cancer risk in younger women and to understand risk for certain subtypes of breast cancer, particularly those that are extremely aggressive may show up at younger ages and also may appear in between regular screenings. So trying to target and understand who's at risk for those cancers. Um, also, um, as I mentioned, uh, active surveillance for DCIS, uh, we're looking forward to continuing and, and sort of uh, putting a new phase of our active surveillance trial for DCIS for hormone positive DCIS, really using that as uh, a way to understand prevention and how can we prevent breast cancer in general, trying to use uh, new models and new imaging techniques to see who's responding to certain medications, uh, who's responding to certain prevention medications, and using imaging to really understand if uh, prevention medications are working. Um, other examples that we usually get feedback on are, you know, did your blood pressure go down if you were given a blood pressure medication? And we don't really have that marker in breast cancer prevention medications. So we're really hoping to use imaging to understand whether or not um, a therapy is working and hopefully will help to encourage people to stay on that therapy so they can continue to see the benefits of that preventive medication. So those are two that I'm really excited about. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, we, we, uh, and we're excited that there are now, you know, lower, um, lower doses of medications that are actually much, much, much more tolerable. So making, I think, prevention uh, medications much more accessible to everyone. All right, so now, okay, let's put up our Q&A slide, Rashna, and then we'll go back to our panel. Dr. Laura Vanfier is going to be getting questions from the, um, from the uh, audience and reading out those questions, and then we'll get our panelists to respond, okay? So there should be a Q&A uh, button on the bottom of your screen. If you have questions, go ahead and put them in. And uh, Laura Vanfier is going to read them out. And we're and I'm going to get them to the panelists and we'll get your questions answered. And we'll keep doing this for the next, you know, 35 minutes or so. Uh, and then we'll wrap up. Okay, so Laura, go ahead. And then we can go ahead and put our uh, speaker view back on. Yes, um, I think I have one question and Hope already gave some answer in the chat, but it might be, or the q and it might be worthwhile to come back to that. And the question is that pembrolizumab is one of the drugs in immune modulation, but there are many. And how do we know which one of those drugs works? And is this a group of drugs? How does it work? So Hope, you want to start with that? Yeah, um, I'm happy to do that. You know, having started working in uh, immune, immune therapies many decades ago in the lab, uh, it's amazing to see it come around to breast cancer. Pembrolizumab is a drug called a checkpoint inhibitor. And what it does really is to take away the invisibility cloak that cancers can put over themselves to prevent the body, our own immune systems from seeing the cancer. There's other aspects of this that are really important though. The cancer has to generate an immune response by the patient's immune system. And that means that your body has to see those cells as foreign and something to get rid of. Really slow growing cancers, lobular slow growing cancers, for example, they don't look much different from normal cells. So it's hard for the immune system to see them as, uh, as something foreign and there doesn't seem to be much immune response. Faster growing cancers like triple negative cancers, HER2 positive, uh, and some aggressive forms of hormone receptor positive disease do have those characteristics. And we've been actively looking at immune therapy there. So checkpoint inhibitors, there's an approved one for breast cancer called pembrolizumab or Keytruda. That's approved for patients with metastatic triple negative disease, but it's only in about 35% of patients whose cancers express an immune marker called pd one in the neoadjuvant setting for triple negative disease before you have surgery like ISPY2, pembrolizumab improved the number of patients who had no invasive cancer at the time of surgery, along with chemotherapy. And it also decreased the number of recurrences and distant recurrences after surgery. So that's why in ISPY, we've been looking at different checkpoint inhibitors and different ways to stimulate the immune system. We know that not everybody needs pembrolizumab. 
there are late toxicities from immune therapy. So one of the things that iSpy is doing and other trials is to try and understand if there are patients who don't need the checkpoint inhibitor and maybe will do well with other therapies. And then we could add the checkpoint inhibitor in situations where uh, it really seemed to be needed. And then this um, ability to try and identify cancers that have an immune response uh, by doing the test that we're now doing, a test called IMPRINT and iSPY2, might help us further identify patients who are most likely to benefit. At the same time, we look at these newer immune stimulants and injection into the cancer itself, for example, to try and help the body see that cancer as foreign. So that's just a very brief overview uh, of this area. And, and if you think about it, the talk that uh, Rachel Woody gave in the super early stage, that DCIS, that high-risk DCIS, that's one of the things that we're learning. If you've got a lot of immune cells there, you have much more capability of amplifying that response and getting, making, you know, the DCIS cells go away. Now, again, we've also learned that it's not just about having the cells present. They have to, the right cells have to be there. They have to be close enough to other ones where they can really have that reaction. One of the cool things over the next five years is that, you know, we fully expect to understand this better and maybe learn more about how to harness the immune system better. And hopefully, as Hope said, you know, not cause some of the late immune toxicity. So unfortunately, there's not really a free lunch. There's always, you know, you have to be careful. So you don't, it's not like, okay, this is a drug and we want to use it for everyone. We don't, we want to use it where it's going to work because we don't want to cause toxicity where it's not going to help. Uh, okay, we're looking at combining. I have a, um, maybe a related question to this, which is interesting, which is about a question that Nicholas already partly answered, which the question, original question was, radiation seems to be given always after surgery. So how about before surgery? And, and I think that's an interesting relation to what we just discussed. And then I'll have a question related to that to Sarah. Uh, go ahead, Nicholas. Yeah, so um, classically, uh, surgery would come first and radiation af after to basically kill microscopic cancer cells that might be left behind. And radiation prior to surgery was really reserved for cases where the, the disease was so bulky or, or advanced where surgery maybe wasn't possible. However, we've had such great advances with chemotherapy and chemotherapy given prior to surgery that now we're able to oftentimes shrink down advanced disease to make it resectable and, and reserve radiation for afterwards. However, as we're discussing, there's now a growing opportunity to look at the use of radiation uh, in the setting of uh, priming the Im immune system and delivering that radiation prior to surgery. So um, some trials are, looking, are randomizing patients or people with cancer to no radiation, a low amount of radiation, and a higher amount of radiation given with immunotherapy and chemo prior to surgery to see if we can have um, an increase in markers of the immune system in the blood, more pathologic complete responses, and uh, higher chances of cure down the road. Great, and Sarah, I, I you know I think it's worth thinking about that when we get some of these advances, you know, how do we know that they're really good for everyone when in fact we know historically that in most trials we do a really terrible job of including, you know, uh, a diverse population and particularly patients from even you know rural areas or socioeconomically underserved areas. So, um, does that make a difference? Um, you, you mean, I mean, you mean? Do, is it, is it important? You know, why is it so, I mean, it, th this is an area where we really haven't really shown or gotten these trials or gotten, you know, participation really as broadly as we should, you know, why does that matter? So, um, the, the importance of it, of course, is as we have this technology to help identify better the tumor types. Um, so we know better what drugs are going to work in what type of tumor types. It's going to be important for people who are, you know, in rural areas or in, you know, different ethnic or racial populations to be involved with studies to see what their molecular makeup is and how they respond to the drugs as well. Um, we're finding out, I think, because questions are now being asked uh, about this, 
um, in studies looking at the differences in response by different groups that not everybody responds the same. And pri you, you would never know this if you didn't ask that question. Um, and it's not across the board, you know, it's not all black people respond the same way to all different types of treatments, but there are sometimes a higher incidence of different genetic changes within a group that might, again, make you more likely to look at that patient a different way, start, you know, considering different drugs. And you would never know that if those patients weren't in your study. Um, you know, in terms of things like rural oncology and, and access to clinical trials, I think that um, the most important, you know, message for that is that is just access. It's just having the patients able to get the, the best treatments first, because we know that clinical trials can take years. And that in, if you have in, um, areas in rural America where you don't have any clinical trials around, so all the patients have to wait until the drugs have been FDA approved, you'll have a delay in patients getting the best treatment. Um, and so I think you know that we have, we have to have a commitment to at least have that option available to all people, not just those in the inner cities near academic centers. That's true. And probably, Allison, that's true for screening as well, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. So Laura V. Next yeah, question. So maybe for those of you who are waiting for answers, I will, I will convey three sets of questions. One is on MRI and screening, and then about exercise and recurrence. Um, and the third one is metastatic disease. But we'll start with MRI and screening. There, there are a couple of questions about MRI. Um, and, and that has also to do with access to care, whether you have to be in a trial to get an MRI when you're healthy um, and maybe have dense breasts to get that type of screening. And also if you are a, a survivor, how can you get or should you get MRI? And related to that, can in some cases that be replaced by ultrasound as some patients maybe prefer? Okay, so Allison, I'll let you start with, you know, can you get an MRI if you're at high risk? Does that have to be through a trial or not? And maybe I'll talk about uh, after you've had cancer. Um, it does not have to be through a trial. If you have a certain level of risk, then most insurance companies will cover it. Um, in the wisdom study, for example, we're um, using lots of different risk factors to quantify that risk. Um, and you can uh, make an argument to the insurance companies that uh, you have a high enough level of risk to warrant an MRI. Um, and if you're part of a study or you are working with a medical provider, you can work with them to provide that evidence of, of risk. Um, so yes, if you are high enough risk, an MRI is covered. And it's considered standard of care. So if you're a mutation yeah. carrier, you have a specific combination of risk factors, and then you can get a letter of medical necessity. And this is standard practice. It, we call that intensive surveillance. So a lot of questions about is dense breast tissue alone enough to dictate an MRI, the use of an MRI? And the answer to that is no. 50% of women have dense breast tissue. And it's really important to know that there are four categories of density. And, and on your report, it might be like A, B, C, and D, you know, fatty breasts, scattered densities, you know, uh, dense fibroglandular tissue or extremely dense or, um, homogeneously dense. That's how it's reported as ABCD. Only 10 to 15% of people have the highest density. And that's actually where MRI, I mean, where MRI makes the most sense, but it makes the most sense really in the setting where you have high risk, because all of these tests have a lot of false positives and you can get called back when you don't need to. That's why we think it's important to have a combination of risk. That's what we do in the wisdom study if you're in the personalized arm. And in wisdom 2.0, we're going to have everybody uh, you know, have the choice of whether they want to do annual screening or the personalized um, arm. Um, but it's very important that, that, you know, people know that it's a combination of risk and density. After you've had cancer, not everybody needs to be screened with an MRI. The kind of thing that we look at is whether you have inherited risk, like you are a mutation carrier and you've decided not to have um, a, a mastectomy or bilateral mastectomy as, as, as prevention. A lot of people choose to, to keep their breast tissue. 
We do intensive surveillance in that setting, alternating every six months, some kind of screening annual MR with annual mammography. Um, if you have dense breast tissue, if, you, if your tumor wasn't seen initially on mammogram, and particularly if you have high risk. So a lot of times if you started with a bad cancer, and we know again, because we've started with the systemic therapy first, if you have a lot of tumor left, you know, then we're gonna screen you a little bit more intensively. But if you've had a fantastic response and your risk is really low, we don't have to torture you and screen you that intensively. So these are the ways in which we can personalize uh, screening. And there are actually some exciting new tools that are out. There is um, contrast enhanced mammography. It's being done in some parts of the country and not others. It's actually being used increasingly around the world. That actually looks like it's gonna be the better alternative for people with extremely dense breast tissue. I think it'll be better than, than what we call 3D mammography. So that's exciting and that's coming, that's, that's gonna be coming up. It's gonna be offered very soon at UCSF and, and as a part of an important study. Again, that's how we move things forward. So that's an answer. Now, ultrasound, ultrasound is a great tool to try and figure out whether you have a lesion that's present and it's a great way to direct biopsies. It's not a great screening tool, not standard ultrasound, um, because it has an extremely high false positive rate. We know in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, we are screening ultrasound is done for a large part of the population that the recall rates are about 30%. So it's too high. So we don't really recommend that as a screening test. Can I um, just quickly ask you, Laura, about, and I guess anybody else who has this information, there's been some questions about MRI non-contrast, no gadolinium, where there's a trial at Stanford. Is that something you would ever recommend for screening? Um, I hope in the future it will be. Um, that's called diffusion weighted MRI. And um, we're working with Nola Hilton and Savannah Partridge on this. This is sort of something that Savannah has been working on for over a decade. We actually do it as part of the, um, of the iSpy trial. So we're trying to get there. It's not quite ready for the prime time. We hope maybe sometime in the future it would be because it's really simple. It would be relatively inexpensive way to do it. And no compression, that would be great. It's not quite there yet. It's still, that's the kind of thing that has to be part of trials until it's ready for the prime time. But that's, you know, again, when you would participate in that kind of a trial, you get the standard and you get the diffusion weighted imaging alongside. Right. So we can work on trying to develop it. And when it's ready, then we'll bring it out as a, as a clinical test. So if somebody was allergic to gadolinium and high risk, um, maybe going to the high risk clinic at UCSF would be one option to talk about different screening mm -hmm. options. So you can, and again, if you're allergic to gadolinium, you could do again the contrast enhanced mammography that I think will probably be just as good. I, I'm very excited about this. I think it's a an inexpensive um, a way of getting the same kind of information you get with an MRI and maybe have less false positives too. So I think that's very exciting. That'll be available in the next month or so. Laura V, next. Mute. Um, so the next question is about lifestyle and exercise and things that we can control and how do they relate to prevention and recurrence? So who wants to take that one on? Um, uh, well, I can I, do that. Okay, go ahead, Sarah. Okay. So, um, right. That's an important question because patients always want to know what they can do because um, that allows you to have a little control. Um, and so exercise we know is not only just good for you overall, and, and it doesn't have to be that, you know, 30 minutes, you know, four times a week. It's just any exercise, walking, um, you know, parking your car farther away so you can get some steps in. Uh, it's not only, again, healthy for you, it, there is evidence to show that exercise can help decrease um, recurrences from breast cancer if you've had breast cancer. Um, in other cancers, um, exercise is showing that it also can help to prevent some cancers. Not only exercising, but um, keeping your weight down to the weight that's appropriate for your height, your, they call it your BMI, your body mass index, because that's different for everybody. So we're not saying everybody needs to be skinny, you just need to be at the appropriate weight 
for yourself and your, if you don't know how to figure out your, bo your body mass index, you can always talk to your doctor and say, you know, where should I be with that? Um, and then as, you know, Laura probably spoke to uh, earlier, eating healthy. Um, you know, I tend to really advocate for plant-based dieting um, as close as you can. Uh, but yes, poultry and seafood and things like that are, are healthy. And who, knew, and who knew that crispy tofu could be so delicious? <laughs> tofu is wonderful. And, you know, now they make tofu sausage. So, you know, it's, I think it's only going to get better for tofu. Um, I, I, Sarah, can I ask you just to, because some of the questions were in there. Do we really know that having, you know, uh, meat, say, once every couple of weeks or once a month is bad for you? I mean, does everybody really need to adhere to what you're saying now? No, you're correct. Meat, there's no nothing to say that having, you know, red meat in moderate amounts is bad for you. Um, and, and I try to clarify that because I am kind of projecting a little bit. <laughs> so, and I know I, my family does not eat plant-based, um, but um, yes, every, you know, red, even red meat in moderation um, is okay. Um, it's certain diseases like colon cancer, there's been a, a more of an, you know, an, a evidence to show that it may impact the, the development of cancer more than others. But in, even in the red meats that you eat, just, you know, make sure they're lean, um, you know, try to get, you know, you can look at the package and, and make sure there's not a lot of fat in it. So, so just being smart, just the same with alcohol, you know, when they say just, you know, drink moderately if you, if you feel you need to have some alcohol. Uh, so we're not trying to make your life miserable, <laughs> but you know, that you can, you can be healthy um, and, and still enjoy things that you like in your life. Um, so and and I always like to tell people on alcohol, people want to know, gosh, can I, what, what's the rule on drinking? I think the, there, there's lots of controversy in a lot of ways, but there is no controversy that a lot of alcohol increases your risk. That was actually one of the risk factors that we uncovered in Marin County, that people were drinking a lot of white wine. But I think one of the things you can say is that if you stick, if you, it's very consistent a little bit of alcohol is not gonna hurt you. And there are studies actually that some alcohol actually reduces your risk of heart disease. So if you can stick to three to five glasses of wine a week, something about that, a drink, if you like having a drink once a week or you wanna have a little bit, couple of times a week, you know, really just, you know, pick one night, have more than one glass or pick two nights where you have a little bit and the other start making mocktails. They're really fun actually, you know, start putting, cranberry juice and some soda water and a little bit of lime and put an umbrella in it and, you know, put it in a fun glass and, and, and enjoy it. And most people can manage that way. And so it's easy to do some of the things that's one of the easier lifestyle changes to make, you know, but, you know, we know even in hormone receptor positive breast cancer that, you know, if changing your diet and exercising was a pill, we'd all prescribe it, but it's actually hard to, you know, these are all kinds of hard changes. So, you know, think about, you know, if it's really hard for you to get to exercise, think about getting a trainer because, you know, once you pay for it, you feel really obligated to do it. Get yourselves into the habit, as Sarah said, park your car farther away, make sure you walk, go out, you know, when you want to go meet with friends, you know, make walking part of it before you go down and maybe even have a meal. So those are, there are ways in which you can try and incorporate that into your day-to-day -day life. And that's part of the reason why we do um, a cooking demonstration as part of Taste for the Cure. So show that there are kind of fun, really interesting dishes to make that can be super healthy. Okay, Laura V, I think it's, another I think question. We need to get back a little bit to metastatic disease. We talked a lot about early recurrence after surgery in the ISPY trial. So there are two types of question. Uh, one type of question is about late recurrences. So the group of patients that will have a late recurrence, what if then the metastasis occurs, what to do, and trials in metastatic disease in 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 general, what's what's happening there? So two parts to that question. I hope we'll take that to send that to you. Okay. So the first part of the question was how can you determine your own late risk of recurrence if you have breast cancer? And this is first determined by the receptors. So if you have hormone receptor positive cancer, you have a greater chance of later recurrence than if you have hormone receptor negative cancer, um, even within HER2 positive disease. But if we just exclude HER2 positive disease for a minute, 
triple negative breast cancer is we call front loaded, the risk of recurrence. Uh, so in the first three to five years, we see almost all recurrences except for the rare slow growing subtypes of triple negative disease. For hormone receptor positive disease, if your risk was say 10% when you started, although you know it's pretty tough to get a specific number in there for any patient, you know, there might be half of that risk in the first five years and half of that risk from year five to 20 or past. Uh, but this is also influenced by a number of factors. If you have a very, um, say, mammoprint, very high score risk hormone receptor positive disease, these cancers act more like the triple negative cancers and they have more recurrence in the first five years. If you have a slower growing, uh, lower score hormone receptor positive disease, that recurrence risk goes out for a long time. How do you know what your risk is? It is also impacted by the amount of cancer that you had at diagnosis. So if you had more cancer at diagnosis, the risk is relatively higher. It's impacted by hormone therapy. So for example, taking hormone therapy and specific types of hormone therapy in specific settings reduces your risk. And then we're looking at and have looked at multiple trials now with some of them very long-term follow-up um, what, what happens if you continue treatment after five years with endocrine therapy? And it appears to be, based on the data that we've had, that again, patients who have more cancer, just in the most you know, global overview, seem to have more benefit from the extended hormone therapy versus patients who have very small cancers because their risk is small. So the actual absolute benefit of taking more endocrine therapy may be uh, weighed, it has to be weighed against the ongoing side effects patients have from hormone therapy. There is one uh, gene expression predictor called the breast cancer index or BCI. And there they have looked in many trials at whether or not extending endocrine therapy helps outcome. It may be that in higher risk disease, it may be a predictor. It does appear to have some prognostic uh, impact. So it can tell you a little bit about your own individual risks. And you take, it's really a, a incredible because you take the tumor from your original surgery and you do that test, you're already five years out. Um, and it can give you an idea a little bit about later recurrence risk. We're doing some studies. One study is looking at a newer kind of endocrine therapy that patients would uh, switch to or not after five years. So if you got to be five years and you knew you were going to continue endocrine therapy, you could try this class of drugs called oral SIRDs or selective estrogen receptor down regulators versus the endocrine therapy you already were planning to take. And I think that's really interesting. People are looking at cell-free DNA or bits of cancer uh, DNA in the blood to try and also see whether or not that could help predict patients who need longer endocrine therapy. Yeah, and one good thing is if you if you have a bad cancer and you start with your therapy first and all your tumor goes away, it actually turns out that that's a situation where it doesn't matter what you started with. I mean, the more you have left, the more it depends what you started with. But if you really, if it all goes away, that response to therapy really tells us so much and helps us guide your therapy. So that's one of the reasons why we're so excited about you know, these trials of giving the therapy first uh, before we go on. Um, okay, uh, Laura V, one last question. Thank you, Hope. One last question. So that also relates some questions were about what do we actually know about um, family cancer history for breast cancer and genetic testing and, and how, how can we actually get to the, the information that we need to understand our genetic risk? And that sort of also somebody asked to actually, what is the definition of high risk? And I agree with that question. Somebody with a gene mutation in one of the breast cancer genes has a high risk to develop breast cancer just based on that. Um, right. And, and so how do we get to that all, all that information? And, and should we join the wisdom study or, or how do we, what is our best option? Okay, Alison, I'll have you, I'll have you take that. Yes, so there are many pieces to the puzzle of how to define risk and what we're doing in wisdom is taking them all together into a comprehensive risk assessment um, to understand who's at, at high risk. So that includes your family history, it includes biopsy history, have you had prior biopsies, what were the results of those biopsies, um, breast density is another big one. Um, and then genetics. And usually in standard clinical care, you're only offered genetic testing for breast cancer if you have a really strong family history. 
Um, in the wisdom study, if you're in the personalized arm, we're offering genetic testing to everyone in the personalized arm, regardless of your family history. And what we've learned to date with about 20,000 women who have completed the genetic testing um, is that over 50%, even closer to 60% of those people who end up having a genetic mutation do not have a first degree family member with breast cancer. And so that means that there are a lot of people who have genetic risk out there who may not otherwise be offered genetic testing. So there's lots of pieces to the puzzle. Family history doesn't tell you the whole story. Um, other risk factors don't tell you the whole story. It's really having that comprehensive risk assessment that can help us to understand who's at risk and to be able to intervene and offer prevention and risk-reducing strategies to those who are at high risk. You know, there's something else that we've learned that's, I think, really exciting, and that is, you know, we use, there's more information than just those, there's nine genes that are associated with breast cancer, but there's another, um, there's another uh, set of genes, all, all the genes that you inherit, you know, there's many genes that you inherit by themselves, they don't mean much, but together, many, polygenic risk, polygenic risk, it actually helps us understand some other ways to adjust your risk up and down. And one of the things that we were learning is the standard way of doing it predicts for these slower growing hormone receptor positive breast cancers. And a lot of our risk models, not surprisingly, predict for that kind of cancer because that's the most common cancer. But what's important about that is that really then identifies a group of people who's going to benefit from risk reduction. Nobody thinks twice if they've got a strong family history of heart disease or if they themselves have high cholesterol, everyone takes a statin or they work in lowering their blood pressure. Nobody thinks twice about that. That's what we should be doing in breast cancer. Our goal should be to prevent breast cancer. And maybe only 10%, five to 10% of people really need that, but the people who do could drop their risks in half. And the people with mutations could also benefit from more intensive surveillance. So these are things that we can do today that really matter. That's what we're testing the wisdom study. And maybe Allison, you could just answer Laura's question about like who's eligible and then how do people sign up? And, and you know, even for the people who've had breast cancer who aren't, you know, how, what can they tell their friends? Right, so any woman across the country, anywhere in the country, regardless of where you receive your care, can join up for the Wisdom Study on the website, www.thewisdomstudy.org, and we'll put the links in the materials that will follow. Um, you can sign up online on your phone, on your computer. Um, you sign a consent form and fill out questionnaires all mm -hmm. online. Um, if you're in the personalized arm, which I mentioned has the genetic testing, we actually mail you a, a, a test kit in the mail. You spit in a tube and you mail it back. So you never actually have to travel to a study site or go meet with the study team. It can all be done virtually. Um, so it's a pretty easy study to participate in all on your own time. Again, any woman across the country who has never had breast cancer or DCIS who is between the ages of 40 and 74. Um, again, you know, many times people ask, you know, what can my friends and family do who have not been diagnosed, help to support breast cancer research. This is one of those incredible opportunities to contribute to the knowledge so that we can try and prevent more women from being diagnosed and try and identify those at high risk so we can offer prevention and risk reducing strategies. Okay, I'm going to close by asking each one of you to do something uh, a little hard, but maybe like one or two cents about yeah how would you answer this questions if you know more people participated in the trials what's the biggest impact that that could have and what kind of future can you see for your particular field okay hope you're fast on your feet i'm going to start with you <laughs> <laughs> so if more people participated in clinical trials we would deliver the best therapy to patients earlier with the least toxicity and change the outcome of breast cancer as we know it today. It is the efforts of patients who have selflessly participated in clinical trials that have already led to the remarkable advances of the last several decades, but just in targeted therapy for breast cancer, we have made unbelievable strides in proving survival in a number of settings and managing toxicity. This is all because of people like you. Clinical trials are the cornerstone to changing outcome. And where I'm most excited 
is being able to apply these treatments specifically to patients based on who they are and what their cancer is telling us. And we're gonna achieve that in the best possible way, first by early stage cancer in trials like iSpy, second by further evaluating markers from cancers, both in the cancer and in the blood, and third by trials that we do in the metastatic setting that we've already shown this year can really change the entire spectrum of what we do. Okay, what a fantastic response. Okay, Sarah, from your perspective, if everyone in different communities were able to participate, what might you see? What would the future, what, what future could you look at? So, you know, like Hope, I'm so excited about personalized therapies um, because I think that's where, you know, our future is. In the past, it's been so frustrating to talk about, you know, the differences in how patients respond and not really knowing why. And we're getting down to this point where we're really being able to characterize the tumors and then develop drugs for these drivers. So I'm excited about really, really, really personalized medicine, like someone coming in and just, you know, because of looking at their, you know, ana molecular analysis, knowing what to give them, at, which will make them live longer. And I'm also excited about having more therapies because I'm seeing women, especially with metastatic disease, live like it's a chronic disease, you know, more opportunities for drugs to be effective at keeping their cancer from growing, like her too low within her too. I, I had a patient who had gone through all the chemo, but she was her too low, but didn't have an option for treatment until you know the, the study showed that now you can use a drug for that. So it's just an example of um, you know something that's so important to the patient being available. And actually seeing it really across every walk of life in every community and every woman having that having that opportunity, right? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Nicholas, your field, what could you imagine that could be so great and so different because of trials? Broadly, I hope that we get to a point where we don't have to give as many people treatment, that we can prevent cancers and avoid treatment altogether. Specifically to radiation treatment, um, I think we have an opportunity to be a technology and a treatment that can be highly effective with little to no side effects in a non-invasive way. Uh, for people who uh, were Star Trek fans and used to watch that show, you know, they were sick and they would lay down on this scanner and this, in this non-invasive way, the scanner would move and, and they would be treated and cured of their problem. And um, that's a bit fantasy, but there is an opportunity for radiation specifically to be a, a tool that is non-invasive with little to no side effects, treating people and curing them of their cancer. It requires close collaboration with all the other disciplines and clinical trials to advance those, those chances. Okay, well, that is quite a future. So excited to participate in that with you, Nicholas. All right, Allison, bring us home. Tell us what you think, uh, what you're looking forward to and what's exciting to you. Um, I think what's exciting to me is really trying to understand um, how we can intervene and identify women at high risk. And again, hopefully try and make prevention more of the mainstream, make preventive therapies more of the mainstream. The example of high blood pressure medication is, is one of them where it's um, tolerable and there are ways in which we can monitor whether it's working um, and we find the right people who need that intervention. Um, that's what's exciting to me is really, again, being able to tailor screening and prevention and, and be able to intervene um, appropriately. Right. So understanding who's at risk for what kind of breast cancer and, you know, maybe looking forward to five or 10 years from now where breast cancer is not the scourge it is today and two thirds of women never even who might have gotten it before wouldn't even get it. That would be amazing. Right. And we know who to screen, who not to screen decrease the burden of screening, screening smarter would be pretty awesome. Well, that is quite a future. Uh, we are all working hard to make that future a reality. As I say, uh, clinical trials are tomorrow's treatments today. I hope you've come to understand that that's really the benefit of participating in trials and that you will work with us to really help to educate the public that trials really aren't something to be afraid of, there's something to be embraced and that everyone should have that option and it should be a routine part of care to discuss clinical trials. I wanna thank our panelists, you guys did an amazing job. So grateful for you for taking your Saturday and spending it with us and helping us understand uh, all the opportunities through trials and how it impacts your field. 
Thank you again so much. Thank you to all of you who participated in this event. Thank you to the interns for fantastic presentations and uh, to Rashna Sunavala, to Melinda Walker, to Anne-Marie Halata, and to uh, Hope Timberlake for helping work with the uh, interns on those fantastic talks. And of course, to Ali Mountford from uh, Ends and Stems for that fantastic cooking demonstration and the whirlwind mess I made in my kitchen anyway, which was very delicious. So thanks again to everyone for participating. Hopefully we'll see you again. Thank you, Laura Van Fury, for your great talk on science and for moderating our questions. And um, if you have any questions or comments, please you know, email us at Taste for the Cure. And Kyle, thank you for your technical assistance and all the, um, and I, I, I hope this worked for uh, our interpreters and uh, sorry if we spoke too fast, but I hope we're able to reach more people. And uh, thanks again, we'll see you in person next year at our annual Taste for the Cure and Taste of Science. Thanks so much for, for, for spending your Saturday with us.